All right, hello world, this is CS50 on Twitch. My name is Colton Ogden. Apologies for the microphone being muted. I uh, turned it off briefly and forgot to turn it back on. Um, this is part two of our stream on Solitaire, um, also known as Klondike, and it's a popular card game, or at least was popular, in Canada and the United States. Last week, I'm gonna transition to my laptop, we ended things with Things uh, with a board sort of like this with a little bit of grid, a grid layout in the background, some cards. And this was just kind of a test to make sure that we had our, our deck actually working with random card draws. In addition to the ability to click and drag a card around, or just a, 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 a sprite backing, rather. Um, but, you know, things are sort of moving in the right direction, but we do have a long ways to go. For example, today, some of the things that I'd like to bite off are, one, actually laying out the board in a way that makes sense. Um, normally in solitaire, things are laid out such that, and we'll look at Google Images in a second, but cards are laid out here in a sequence at the bottom, this bottom row, starting with one card, then two cards, then three cards, and four cards, etc., with only the top card being visible. You get a deck up here in the top right, which is important, that's where you draw cards from to put them into more piles. Um, and then at the top, which you can't actually see because the current algorithm is laying the cards out, um, at the very top left, you're actually stacking all the cards of each suit from uh, the bottom to the top, from ace to the king. So to answer Amit's question, uh, the topic of discussion is solitaire. So we're using Love 2D today, um, and the, the framework Love 2D is a really nice framework for 2D game development. You can go to love2d.org. We talked about this in the last stream episode. Definitely check that out if you haven't already seen it, where we implement everything from scratch, including parsing a sprite sheet of all our cards, laying out the grid, creating a deck class and a card class, which we can then shuffle the deck and draw cards from, which is very important because this is sort of the backbone of our whole game. But more on that in part one. Part two today is gonna to be much more about the actual algorithms of laying out the board, getting to click and drag around um, piles of cards, and we'll see just how much we can implement before we get to um, potentially a part three. If we're very lucky, we'll finish a part two, but I, I don't think so. It's a rather meaty game. So thanks everyone for tuning in. I got Asley in the chat, Meow Cat, uh, I'll meet Microsoft India, Pika Mika 2, that chat cat. Uh, Meow Cat asked, will I talk about machine learning? Probably not machine learning today. I'm not a machine learning expert, but uh, it'd be nice to get somebody in the future who is more well-versed in machine learning, such as maybe Nick Wong, who did a prior stream. If you haven't already watched the stream on binary classification with Nick Wong, definitely check it out. It's on YouTube. Probably not on Twitch anymore. It was one of our earlier Twitches, um, and those only save for 30 days. But yes, we are indeed continuing to make Solitaire. Amit Microsoft India says, please share the link. Yes, absolutely. So I'll share two links in the chat here. Let me just pull up the repo name so I remember 100% what it was. I have the code from last week on GitHub. So if you are tuning in and you want to clone the code, if you end up cloning the code now, if you're watching this on YouTube, chances are the code's not going to be the same as this right at this exact moment in time. Luckily, you can download a, a arbitrary commit if you want to. Unfortunately, for some reason, GitHub is taking a long time to load. I'm not entirely sure why, but it looks like it's working. I saved it as solitaire stream. So I'm going to type this into the chat here. Hopefully, this doesn't cause any issues. I just eliminated the macros on this machine so that I could actually type stuff this week. Um, github.com slash coltonoscopy slash solitaire stream. Take that and that should allow you to download the repo. Uh, if you don't know what Love2D is, and whoops, I just ended up switching my view uh, to the wrong one again. If you don't know what Love2D is, you follow that link, download it. It's a cross-platform framework for making 2D games. Hence the 2D in Love2D.org. Unfortunately, it doesn't let you make 3D games. Uh, I'm waiting for the day Love 3D comes out. I think that'll be an amazing development, but alas, it is not a real thing yet. So, Solitaire. Um, for those unfamiliar, let me just pull up an image of the Solitaire starting layout so we can continue and sort of have a visual goal of where we're going next. This is where we're going next. Um, it's not going to look quite like this. This is a little bit fancier texture work done on it. But you can see that the grid is actually very similar to what we laid out last week. You have seven rows, uh, seven columns, sorry, in the bottom row here. These are your uh, stacks, tableaus, goes with different terminology that I'm not 100% clear on. Um, and you can notice that the cards start off on the left with one card being drawn, and that one's face up. The second uh, column has two cards, the top of which is face up, the bottom of which is face down. The third one 
The top card is still face up, but every card is face down. And you can see the pattern continues on until the seventh column. So you get all of these sort of areas to start laying out cards from left to right. Um, and they increase in, uh, going to, uh, in that direction, going towards the right, or one at a time. At the very top left, this is where the actual game is won. And we haven't covered this in too much detail yet. But by stacking every card of each suit, so remember there are four suits, ace, diamond, spades, clubs. So by stacking every card, every ace, or sorry, every uh, diamond card, every hearts card, every clubs card, every spades card from ace to king, that's how you actually win the game. And so what you're looking for when you first start is, of course, an ace. Because if I, if I find an ace, well, I can stack an ace here, or an ace here, or an ace here, depending on which suit it is, right? And that gives you the ability to then lay a two on top of that, and then a three on top of that. And by the time you finally make your way up to king, you've won the game, if you get all four of them out. And to get new cards, which you can lay out either here on any of these piles, or on these four winning piles, you have the deck here that you can draw cards from. It's also called the stock. And so if I draw, for example, an ace right here, I could put that in one of the piles. Or if I draw, a, for example, a, um, and it goes um, lower value down, if I were to draw a three, a black three, I could put it on top of this red four, right? Because the cards that you lay out on all of these, this is an important rule of solitaire, when you're laying cards out on your seven piles, they need to alternate in color. And they need to go from top to bottom. They need to go from king down to, uh, down to ace. So this four, for example, I could put a, a black three, either a club or a spade three, on this four. I could put an ace on this two, but I'd probably want to put the ace on one of these piles here so I could start building up my, um, my winning piles, right? I want to put the ace first. That's the card you're looking for. I could put a black uh, eight right here. I could put a red queen here. I could put a red six here, a red seven here, a red two here. And this is how you build up your piles that you can move around. Eventually, if you build all of your piles in descending sort of order amongst your seven tableaus, you can very easily take cards from any of these piles and then put them in your winning piles. And so this is a refresher on how the mechanics of solitaire work and so that we have a clear picture of where we're going as we implement our game. An important thing that I think we should first think about implementing is populating these seven columns down here in this bottom row. I also probably want to get rid of this drawing these five random cards. Uh, and then maybe also just rendering a, a, a card backing here, and that'll be representative of our deck. Tuxman, thank you very much for tuning in to the stream. And thank you very much to KZOXY and South Africa for the follows right before the stream started. Uh, and again, any questions on the rules or what we've done so far, definitely leave them in the chat. I'll be watching that as we go along. Twitch.tv slash CS50TV as well. All right, so let's take a look here. So the, what we did last time was we implemented the game board. And what this was was just our basically just drawing the screen green and then those rectangles, the, the grid layout for where we want to place our cards. And um, that's essentially the backbone of where we're going to end up placing stuff. And of, we're probably going to want some notion of a card pile later on, which has a bunch of cards in it. And those cards are going to have to enforce their order and their colorization. So we're going to need to worry about that in a little bit. What I want to do is I want to get rid of the sort of arbitrary rendering that we already have. So what I think I did was in the deck class, I made a, a render function here that just drew the first five cards of the deck. And I don't really want that. I don't want to draw those five cards anymore. So I'm actually just going to pass on that and re-render it. And notice that now we're no longer drawing those five cards, and we indeed have our grid layout as we saw it previously. Right. Um, I also probably don't need this random card that I can click around. I can get rid of that pretty safely. We're implementing, um, we implemented it such that I can click to start the drag. And then it'll just follow my mouse, and then I click again to undrag or undrag the card. And smart thirteen eighteen, thank you very much. Oh, thank you for cool hairstyle. Thank you very much for the for the compliment. I appreciate that. Um, so I think in card actually we may have been doing that in here. Let's see, it might have been in main actually. Let's make sure. Yeah, I think it, yeah we we were rendering a queen of hearts. We we chose to render a queen of hearts just as a test to make sure our card class was working. You can see here in my directory, and this needs to be um, shrunk down a little bit. I can get rid of some of these. But notice that I have a in my source directory in the repo, and if you've cloned the repo, then you'll you'll see this. I have a card class 
which is just representative of what a card is, which stores a suit and it stores a face value, um, which are two important things that we need to, to take into consideration for our algorithm. We'll need to check to see, one, when we place a winning card down in one of our top uh, tables up here, we want to enforce that each of these piles is just one of the same suit, right? Hearts, diamonds, clubs, and spades. When we want to actually stack them, we need to worry about the face value, whether it's a three, a four, a queen, a king. Um, and we'll do that not only here in the winning piles section of our code, where we're also taking into consideration the suit, but we're also going to need to take into consideration, um, well, actually, we need to take into consideration the suit and the face value when we lay it down on the tableaus too, because remember, we need to enforce a red, black um, sort of progression of cards down the line. Now, it doesn't need to necessarily be one suit or the other, a specific one. It just needs to be one of two. If it's a red card, if it's a heart or a diamond, the card needs to be clubs or spades in order for us to lay it down and vice versa. So that's just one thing that we need to take into consideration. So that's why we have a card class. The card class maintains a reference to its face, its suit, whether it's hidden, whether it's picked up, and its x and y value so that we can render it to a given place on the screen. There's also a deck class, which just maintains a list of cards that are all shuffled. We wrote a shuffle algorithm last time. The, um, somebody refresh my memory on what the, the shuffle, uh, Bay, uh, what was it, uh, Yates shuffle? What was it? Bayer Yates shuffle? Uh, and also known as the Newth Shuffle, I think that was what it was. Fisher Yates Shuffle, that's what it is. Essentially just taking a bunch of random, uh, basically indexing into our deck at random, putting it into another temporary deck, and then eliminating that from the prior deck, which saves us a little bit of sparsity. We don't need to keep re-rolling our randomization if we end up messing up um, sort of how we take cards out of the deck. And also shout out to David for tuning into the stream. Um, and then Tuxman looks like Tuxman's about to say something for the card placement within the rows as well. So that was what we did with the deck class, very important. We'll be using that to draw individual cards for our stock later on in the game. We needed a dependencies module so that we could actually um, not only specify where our textures are laid out, but also to splice them apart and store a reference to the quads that we used in the last, uh, demo, the last video which were just rectangles that represent a chunk of our texture. Because we don't want to draw our entire sprite sheet. Recall, and we'll pull this up here, the actual sprite sheet for our game is this large chunk of graphic, right? It's all of our cards put together into one image. And we don't obviously want to draw that anywhere in our game. We want to draw just a piece of it. So we define what's called a quad, a rectangle, um, short for quadrilateral, just an x, y, and a width and a height. And by passing that into a function in Love2D, it'll just draw that piece of the texture. It won't draw the entire thing. And that was a part of the last stream. Tune into the last stream for how we actually implemented that. We wrote a couple of functions. We had to end up actually fixing our graphic a little bit because for some reason some things were out of order. Um, and even after we did that, cards were still in the wrong order. Queens were coming before kings, and ace was coming before 10. It was kind of a mess. But we fixed it in code, which is an important lesson, I think, in dealing with graphics. Um, and this has come up in, a, in a, some comments as well. When dealing with graphics that you don't have any control over their layout, sometimes you do have to, in code, fix things yourself. So it's an important, at least, lesson to be aware of. Ideally, though, work with an artist, specify for them, I need graphics laid out in this way, I need everything laid out, ideally, in a systematic way so that you can algorithmically uh, sort of splice things in a clean way. Um, but, you know, you don't always have that luxury, you won't always work with an artist, and you might not always be talented, like myself, as, I mean, sorry, you, like myself, will not be talented enough, necessarily, to fix the artwork that you are given. So sometimes you have to use code instead of you know, digging into it with Photoshop or GIMP or a sprite or et cetera. Um, will this solitaire game tell us when we have no moves left and we have effectively lost? Uh, we can implement an algorithm for that, sure. All we have to easily do, um, well, is it going to be easy to do necessarily? I think so. Because you, you just have to iterate through all the card piles, check to see if they have an available move. And if they don't have an available move and you can't move your cards to the winning piles, then you've effectively lost, including your stock. So yes, it is definitely possible. Uh, in my blackjack game, I just picked a random position from an ordered deck. Yeah, uh, uh, are you, if you're referring to the shuffle, yeah, that's effectively what Fisher Yates is, but just a little bit. We had a little bit of a refinement on Fisher Yates. And Harder Praj, thank you very much for the kind comment. Um, <laughs> as they saying, you're very talented. I remember the awesome flag pixel art. Uh, I, I appreciate it, but I, I don't know if I would go so far as to say that. But I, 
very much appreciate it. Um, I wanted to ask for the placement, a black card, for example, would it be simpler to use heart or diamond or add an additional value to the card as red? Um, I'm inclined to say that since red is a derived value of properties that we already have in the card, we probably want to just keep the heart or diamond and just use an or in that case, rather than create new value that we can derive from the existing value. Um, and there's an argument to be made for against this, but I think the only time at which you want to consider this is when it's very computationally expensive. Um, so I'm, uh, I am more inclined to say we'll use an or in that case and not add, add new data that we can easily just derive with a simple condition. Um, cool, so we have the board all laid out. We were just looking at the different modules. Dependencies is where we stored and parsed all of our texture data. The game board was where we actually drew the background. We can draw our deck. It's where we're going to end up drawing all of our uh, card piles, which are going to be very important because we're going to have different stacks of card piles. Um, and then we also had a util function, and the ut or a util module rather, a file, a util.lua file, which had a few functions in it for parsing our, uh, our texture for quads, so splitting it up into quads, and also um, fixing the fact that they were unordered when we parsed them. And we also uh, used the beautiful tool called Stack Overflow to find a function called dump, which just recursively prints a table, because we didn't feel like writing it from scratch ourselves. But all it does is just writes out a table. Depending on if it's a table or not, it'll output the value. It uh, nicely puts brackets or, or curly braces to at least tell you that you're working with a table. And will recursively call itself and then to string each, each uh, non-table value so that you can eventually see your entire layout of data. And then uh, we had a resort function that ended up sort of putting our cards in the right places. So that is a rough breakdown of what we did last week. Now, the first thing that I want to do so that we're at least visually seeing where we're going and sort of sanity checking the flow of our game, feeling more accomplished than we might actually be, is laying everything out um, on the bottom row. So let me go ahead and go back to deck so that it renders. What we, what we saw in the graphic, recall, was that the piles from left to right start with one cards, then two cards, then three cards, four cards, five cards, six cards, and then finally seven cards. The top card is always face up, the bottom cards are face down, and you reveal cards as by taking cards off of them. So for example, in this second pile, and I'll go to the image here in Google, if I take this two off of this card down here, I can flip that card over, and we'll implement this with right click, probably. I can flip that card over, and it becomes a card that I can now move wherever I want to move it. If it's an ace, well, I just revealed an ace. I can put it in one of my winning piles. If it's, for example, a black three, well, I can put a black three here, and then maybe move this king over here, because you have to uh, end up, you, I believe it's a rule where you can only put a king onto an empty slot in your tableau. I'm not 100% sure about that, actually. Solitaire, move card to empty tableau. Um, yes, if any of the tableau piles are empty, you can move a king there. Right, okay, so that's good. I'm, I am saying you, it has to be a king. So if there's an empty slot, let's say I move this two right here. Let's say I move that onto an ace pile up here. Let's say I got an ace, put it up there. I was an ace of spades. Um, put a two up there on top of the ace of spades. So I'm building that, that spades pile up. Now I have this blank card here. Let's say, I, let's say that's a black three. I move the black three onto this four. Now I have an empty tableau. I can put this king over onto this empty tableau, and now I've sort of opened up a new pile that I can start digging through. And this is sort of the, the fundamental way of playing the game. Lo the loop of the game is just kind of revealing cards, moving cards around until everything sort of falls into place. But yes, that is the flow of the game. Regarding the schedule, is South Africa off by a day because it's Monday here? Um, the schedule should be up to date. It might just need to be shifted one day over. One card, two cards. I'm getting a Mario.c vibe here. Oh yes, only on an empty spot. Um, one card, two cards. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what you're referring to. If you can clarify that for me. I'm not 100% sure. Um, OK. So let's go ahead and think about what we're going to need to do in order to, well, first of all, we're going to need to move cards around. And not only are we going to need to move cards around, but we can actually move piles of cards around from our tableaus. So we will need some notion of a 
card pile, right? And at least this is how I want to frame the game. You could frame this in a multitude of ways. You don't necessarily need to um, abstract it in this specific way, but I'm inclined to say that I'm probably going to want a card pile class. And um, this is all from scratch and off the cuff, but this is just how I go about approaching problems like this by thinking about the objects in my space, the sort of interactions they're going to have, and sort of building up the, the, the building blocks that I'm going to end up actually composing to create my game in this object-oriented way. So this is going to be a card pile class. A card pile class is kind of like a deck, but it's not going to have a shuffle method. It's going to have um, the ability to, I think, move around necessarily, yeah, probably. We could also implement this in another way. What we could do is we could have each individual card parent other cards. We could have it such that this 9, for example, is a parent of the 8 below it. And that 8 is a parent of the 7 below it. So there's always this direct chain of parenting, right? Where you have a card that's a parent of a card that's a parent of a card, kind of like a list almost, almost like a linked list. And what we could therefore do is by moving a parent, you move the child. By moving the child, you move the, its child. Because we could just have each card reference its parent's position. And by doing that, by just you know, calling update and you know, moving something and checking to see whether its parent is in a different position, um, we therefore can move multiple things at the same time. So this is probably the route that we're end, going to end up taking. Um, nested for loops, like Mario C from the C. Oh, I see. Um, oh, right. Yeah, it is kind of like a Mario pyramid. Now that you mention it, it's kind of like a Mario pyramid that's been rotated 90 degrees to the left. I agree. Yeah, it's, kind of, it's very similar to that. Um, this one's a little more complicated just because we have to enforce that the bottom most card, rather the top most card, is always face up. So we will be, we will be doing that. Um, so now I'm actually wondering whether it's even necessary for us, to, for us to implement a card pile class, because we could just enforce this parenting and this piling behavior almost emergently using just basic parenting. So that might, be, that might be a place to start. Why don't we start there? So rather than, we won't worry about cardpile.lua too much just yet. What we will do is we will go into card, and we'll say that every card should have a parent, right? Um, or at least it should have a parent field that we will eventually care about, likely. And I don't necessarily think that it should have a child or we should necessarily need to worry about whether it has a child, we can probably just assume parent, and that will be fine. We will actually care about whether, so I think we will need card piles for the winning piles. We will need, and those are actually gonna be rendered differently, because notice if you look at, well, it won't, it won't be clear here, but if we were to, for example, pull up a, this is interesting, they actually have two, this is a different version of, uh, of a solitaire, it looks like. Let me find an image where they have cards that are already laid out, for example. Um, let's see, solitaire, let's do solitaire in progress. So here, for example, you can see that they have things shifted a little bit. It's kind of, fli it's kind of mirrored, um, not mirrored, but flipped uh, sort of vertically towards the right. Um, well, it's along a vertical flipping point. It's flipped horizontally. But you can see that the winning piles are on the right side here. Notice that there's an ace here. So this is the spades winning pile. This is the hearts winning pile. You can see that there's a two there, which means somebody already laid an ace and then a two. Um, but they're not being rendered vertically down. They're not sort of like, they don't have this cascade, not cascading effect, but sort of this um, shifted offset sort of rendering effect that the piles, the tableaus have on them, right? All of these are sort of rendered vertically such that you can see them, um, the cards that are directly below any given card. And this is useful because we care about that information. We want to ensure that we keep everything in a particular order, and that it's offsuited. Uh, these we don't care about. We know we can. We already know always that we have the uh, the all of the spades here, all of the hearts here, diamonds, clubs, however it's ordered. Um, so we will need to change our rendering logic for both of those use cases. This particular area up top is going to 
probably implement a we might be able to reuse the deck class, but you know, semantically that's not that's not accurate. So a card pile probably is accurate. We might be able to just use it for that and then use parenting for everything else. And so that's probably what I'm inclined to do. Um, so the card piles will be used for the winning piles. It makes more sense probably at that point to then just call it a winning pile, right? So rather than having an overly generic class, since we know that we probably won't use card piles for the other areas of our of our um, um, of our game board, we don't necessarily need to distinguish between the different piles. So we'll 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 sort of write in a winning pile right now. We'll come back to it later. We'll worry about it later. In the meantime, what I do care about, like I said, is laying out all of the board and then testing our interactions, testing parenting, making sure that's all working, so that we can start clicking and dragging cards in the right locations. So back to the card class, which we're looking at up here. We have a parent that's going to be sort of kept within that class. So this will refer to any of the card. This will refer to a card directly above another card in um, the context of solitaire. And actually, let me see. The parents are actually going to be rendered below. So the child cards, like so eight here is a child of nine. So nine is, so eight has a reference to nine as its parent, right? Nine has a reference to 10 as its parent. 10 has a reference to Jack, Jack has a reference to Queen, and Queen has a reference to King as its parent. And by moving Queen, right, we will sever that parent-child relationship, which is an important thing we need to do so that they don't get rendered, um, or they, the, the, the King doesn't follow the Queen. We'll sever the relationship between the King and the Queen. And then we will make sure that all of the children refer to their parents for their position. So if the 8 is saying, make my position my parents' position, make, if the 9 is saying, make my position my parents' position, et cetera, but with, shift, with a shift, obviously, uh, like 15 pixels, by moving just the parent, we will effectively move every single child as well. So this is nice. This, this is a very simple way, I think, of looking at the problem. So the self.parent is going to be nil right now. We're going to worry about that. In the meantime, let's go to our deck class. And then I'm going to say, rather, not deck class, sorry, game board class. In here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to store, uh, actually, I already <laughs> sort of sketched it out last time. We have seven tableaus here. Um, and so I'm just going to um, shorthand right now. I think I'm just going to do this. Right, so I have one, one, um, well actually, no, sorry. Uh, we're gonna have seven tableaus like this. These are empty tables. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And we can we could probably do this algorithmically, so we'll we'll consider doing that as well. Um, but just to sketch it out so we know what we're look what we're doing. Uh, Crazy Flute, hey guys, how are you tonight? And Sirox says, hi everyone, hello. Um, we're going to sketch out the layout of our tableaus right here. So the first tableau, remember, if we're looking left to right, eh, the first tableau is going to start with one card. So I can just say, um, actually what we can do is uh, I can say self.deck, and then I want to draw a card, right? That's effectively what, it, what it's going to look like. And then we're going to do it two times here, three times here, four, five, six, and seven. All of those cards are going to be face down. They need to be face down by default, except for the last card, the, um, the uh, what will end up being the ultimate child of that stack. That child will be face up. So this is essentially what it's going to look like. And uh, what will end up, it'll also look like for the second pile, for example, is something like this, right? Now, um, self.deck, sorry, I call it self.draw, should be self.deck, and self.deck draw. It'll look like this, and it'll sort of add more and more and more and more and more, because remember, going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven cards. So clearly, this is going to look a little bit bulky. We can do this in a loop a little bit more effectively down here. So I could say for i equals one until um, and we're just going to, again, adhere to good design. I'm going to say up here, we'll say num tableaus is equal to 7. So back to the game board. From 1 until num tableaus, 
do. Tableau is kind of a tricky word. And ah, uh, again, last time I remember VS Code is having issues with Lua formatting. So uh, if you're using VS Code with the newest version, my apologies. It's uh, hurting me as well. I should probably have not updated, but alas, I did. For uh, From one until the number of tableaus, we're effectively going to do what's in this, uh, this call right here. So I can say self.tableaus. Um, uh, let me see. We'll do table.insert into self.tableaus, a new table. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say for j gets 1 until i, because there's one card for every row. There's seven rows, seven columns, sorry. And each uh, column has i cards, right? Column one has one card. Column two has two cards. Column three has three cards. Uh, so therefore, we have another loop that's just going to go up until i and just draw that number of cards and put it in the right position in, the, in our tableaus, um, in that particular tableau, right? So I can say for j, if for j is one uh, until i, I'm going to table.insert into self.tableaus at i, self.deck draw. And I can delete this right here. Well, what I have to do first is say self.tableaus is equal to an empty table, which is going to become a 2D table here pretty soon. And then we'll just say populate all tableaus with starting cards. And down here in the draw or in the render function, what I want to do is I want to render so that we know that this is working. I want to render all my tableaus. So I can say for i is equal to, and actually I need to figure out where we started our, uh, our actual grid indices. So first of all, let's make sure that that runs. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, it did not. So oh, we didn't implement the actual draw function in our deck. So we need to do that. So over in deck, I'm going to say um, self, or sorry, function deck draw. And what this is going to do is return a card from the deck and remove it. Because we want to draw a card from the deck, but we also want it to not be in the deck after we draw it. Because obviously, if we draw a card, but we keep it in there, we just return a copy of it, well, then our numbers are going to be skewed. We're not going to be dealing with 52 cards. We're going to be dealing with infinite cards at that point. Um, so it's not going to work. Um, Blue Booger says a 2D table, make 3D solitaire, stack the cards in three dimensions. Uh, always with the good ideas, Blue Booger, keep them coming. That's, uh, <laughs> that would actually be pretty cool, though. I'm not going to lie. Uh, I'd be interested to see how that would actually be implemented. Uh, I personally am not sure. Um, Fanmogia21, Georgie La Lay, and C. Uh, Mariti. I have a, a very low font size on this monitor. I cannot read that to save my life. Um, CMR L uh, JRJ, thank you very much for the follow, and Georgie Law. Um, Crazy Flock, the stream started for long. Uh, this has we haven't um, we haven't been doing this particular stream for too long, but we did do a part one, so we are progressed a bit beyond just the you know very beginning of a Love 2D application. So if you haven't checked out Solitaire Part One, highly recommend watching the first part so you can see how we built the deck, how we built our game board, how we uh, parsed our texture, and how we did a bunch of other things. Um, this particular instance builds upon all of that source code. You can you can catch that on YouTube.com/slash. CS50, look at our, um, our Twitch playlist. And also in Twitch, we have the VOD still up. At the time of this recording, it may not be on uh, at the time you're watching this in the future. OK, so we have our deck, cl uh, our deck class with a draw function that we need to implement so we can actually get a card from the deck and then remove it from the deck. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say uh, local card is equal to, and actually, we ran into this issue before. So what I think what we need to do is make sure that we're making a copy of it. So I'm going to say uh, local uh, card from deck is equal to, and actually I think there's a, there's a copy function, but it might work funky with classes. So we're just going to copy the card effectively uh, and then remove it from the deck. Because all we're effectively doing, if we recall, is just storing a, um, a face and a suit, right? Uh, I got that right? Yeah, a face value and a suit, one of four values. Um, so that's all we really care about. So I'm going to say card from deck is going to be equal to self.cards 
at math.random number of uh, self.cards. So remember, the number is the length of a table. So if we have 52 cards, it's going to give us number 52. If our deck is only of size 40 or 30, it's going to give us that number. And so we get a proper number between 1 and the upper bound of our deck, which is important. Um, and let me just make sure that it's indeed self.cards. I'm going to say local card to return is equal to a card that's going to have card from deck dot face. I think this is right. Face and suit. Yep. Um, and then card from deck dot val. Uh, wait, what did I call it? Uh, suit. I've been having a hard time keeping up with suit and face and value, all these words that I uh, am very bad about remembering. But now what we can do is we can say, um, oh, actually, what we also need to do, we need to store our index. So um, card index is going to be equal to this value right here. I'm going to replace that with card index. I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to say self.cards at card index is equal to nil. Actually, better would be table.remove self.cards at card index which I think underneath the hood just does do a nil assignment. It just assigns it to nil, so that way, because uh, in Lua, if you have a nil index in your table, it effectively just condenses the table back together, if I'm remembering correctly. And so table.remove effectively just does that exact thing, but we might as well just do what's more conventional, I think. Table.remove self.cards at card index. So if we drew a card in the middle of the deck, the deck gets sort of compressed inwards to accommodate that. And now it's no longer 52 cards long, it's 51 cards long. And what I can do then is I can return our card to return. So now we have our new card that we're placing somewhere in our game. We don't care where it is, but not only do we have a card that we copied from our deck, we removed it, and so now we are preserving sort of the gameplay mechanic of drawing a card from a deck. Very important thing to consider. Um, if we didn't do it this way, we would have infinite cards, which would not be um, ideal. Or we would have bugs with uh, uh, signing cards to nil in our deck and them being nil in all sorts of places. Um, cool. So our game board is the next place we need to do this. Oh, right. What we were doing is we were testing, right? So now what I want to do is I want to draw all of these cards that we've just allocated to our seven tableaus. So these are the seven tableaus. I want to draw my, uh, remember, we have seven tables now that fit those tableaus. I want to draw one card, two cards, three cards, four cards. Um, uh, you're looking at it in reverse direction because of, it's flipped because of the camera. One card, two cards, three cards, four cards. Um, we're going to do it that way. And so uh, generate tableaus, I don't think. Oh, you know what I was going to do? This is going to be the generate tableaus function. So self generate tableaus. And then I can just copy and paste that into this empty function, which we must have written last time because I don't think we wrote it this time. I think we wrote this in anticipation of what we needed to do for the next stream. So now we have a generate tableaus function. We sort of uh, have shrunk the size of our constructor. This is our constructor. We don't want too much code in here. This is where you know the object gets instantiated, where all of our values get initialized. Um, having a bunch of logic in here kind of bloats it, makes it hard to keep track of what's going on, so we just made a function instead. So let's actually draw each individual tableau. And what, what we're actually doing that is we're doing it here. Right? We, have a func we, have, we don't have a function yet, but we do have um, seven rectangle calls that are effectively functioning similarly to that. And so I still want the grid to draw in case I move cards away from you know, the tableaus. Um, just thinking ahead a little bit. Yeah, so this is how we're going to need it. And I think that should be fine. Here we're effectively going to check for, because we're going to have tableaus, we're going to have cards in those positions. These seven tables are where we're always going to store the cards, no matter what. Even if we move cards around between tableaus, um, we're not actually storing card pile objects and mixing and matching those. And I actually think that would get relatively complicated and kind of uh, hard to maintain, hard to, um, hard to reason about a little bit. So we're just going to draw each tableau individually and all of its cards and those parent-child relationships that we talked about earlier on are going to help us make sure everything looks and functions in a sane way. Um, so what I'm going to do is for i is equal to 1 until 
num tableaus do. So we're just going to iterate, iterate over and draw cards in tableaus. Um, tableau grid markers just to differentiate them to be more more explicit about what we're actually drawing. So I'm going to again we need a nested loop within this. So we're iterating over our seven tableaus, but we also need to iterate over the cards in the tableaus to actually draw things out. So I'm going to say for j is equal to one until um, tableaus uh, i. Um, number of tableaus I do and because the tableau um, tableaus at I is going to have a length of cards that we need to render and this will this will change over time and it's going to get a little more complicated when we actually need to draw them in the right order with the parenting um, but this should still be doable things should still we'll, we'll have it structured ideally such that um, will preserve the rendering order so that we can iterate over the cards in the right order and draw everything out. Um, and the parent-child relationship will be preserved. Uh, Whipstrake23 says hello. That's Nate. Shout out to Nate. Thank you for joining our stream. Um, so here we can say, so uh, we have a, a place here. So these are our actual individual tableau locations. And there's a mathematical operation that we're applying here, which is 10 plus 80 times i minus 1 in this case. Um, so see 10 plus 80 times i minus 1. So i is 1, minus 1 is 0, 80 times 0 is 0, plus 10 is 10. But you know, plus 1 is uh, times 1 is 90, and then 170, 250, 330. So we're just shifting everything by 80 pixels. So we'll maintain that relationship here as well. So we'll say, um, and we card does have a render function, correct? It does. So we'll say, uh, tableaus i render at 10 plus 80 times uh, j or i minus 1 and at y value 160 and these should be these are kind of temporary variable uh, values because i don't necessarily know where i want the card grid to be drawn, the tableaus to be drawn eventually. Right now, we're just kind of getting everything in place. We can easily add a margin value and shift all of this and change our, our game size so that it's a little bit, maybe a little bit closer up so that things look a little bit more interesting. It's a little bit zoomed out now because the textures are kind of small. Um, so we'll worry about that in time. Right now, let's just get the, the uh, logic correct, and then let's, let's figure out the values that we want at a later time, and then get everything rendering perfectly. Um, also, shout outs to Andre. Thank you very much for joining the stream. And uh, Nate, don't be sorry that you're late. It's OK. You can definitely watch the, the, uh, the VOD and scroll back and watch it on YouTube at any point. Um, so this should work. Now, the only problem is we want to draw all of our cards, but if we're drawing them all at the same x, or if we're drawing them all at the same y value, we're not going to preserve their stacking, right? They're all going to be directly on top of each other, which doesn't help us. So this 160, we can actually add maybe plus 10 times j minus 1, right? Because if we're at j cards, right? If we're at now, if j is 1, then we'll just draw it at the right. We'll just uh, you know, uh, 1 minus 1 is 0, times 10 is 0, so it'll just shift it by 0 pixels. But if we're at j1, or rather j2, and we minus 1, well, then it's 1 times 10. And then we'll, we'll, add, uh, one, we'll add 10 pixels to our drawing, and then 20, and then 30. And so that will give us that stacking order as we draw. So let's do that. Um, and let's actually see if this is working. It is not. Uh, gl global Tableaus, which is a game board line 58, which, yes, self dot tableaus and self dot tableaus at i. Let's try that. Uh, method render a nil value game board 59. Interesting. So self dot tableaus at i at this point is supposed to be a card. And this is a problem with dynamic programming languages. It's not always clear that you're going to have the right data in the right place when you run your application. If you're using a statically typed language like Java, um, then it can actually check to make sure that you're putting things in the right container. But if you're not doing that, if you're using Lua or Python or Ruby or some other languages dynamically typed, then you're going to kind of have to cross your fingers sometimes, just make sure your logic is sound, which mine always isn't, as we can clearly see here. So 
at line 59, attempt to call method render, which is a nil value. So card is nil. Um, at least what we assume to be a card in self.tableaus is nil. So let's see whether our logic is sound. So we have game board generate tableaus. Um, from one until the number of tableaus, we are inserting. Ah, right. So self.tableaus at I actually, right, because it needs to be I, J, right, because we're rendering, we were trying to render our entire tableau table at that point. We need to actually index. Remember, we're storing a table of tables, um, and each table, each nested table contains cards, right? So that's what we needed to do. We need to index into the right tableau, and then we need to get the right card from the tableau, which now, it's, <laughs> it's not rendering anything, but at least our logic is sound. Um, so let's figure out why that might be. That's in, oh, you know why? Because they're not being assigned. Um, well, actually, they are being given an X and a Y. That's what this is here, right? Um, let me see. What is, why is that not working? That is odd. Um, <laughs> now, we didn't make self.hidden true, did we? Card, let's see what the render function is. So card back, right? Okay, and do we want the cards to be hidden on, uh, well, we don't want them to be hidden necessarily. What we're going to do, the next part of what we're going to do is we're going to actually hide all of the cards beyond the, the last card. So we are going to need to worry about that, but at the exact, at this exact moment, we, we want everything to sort of be visible, so let's not worry about that just yet. Instead, let's figure out why the cards aren't rendering. So it looks like we are getting cards up here. Uh, which aren't clickable. This is the Queen of Hearts that we had before. Everything is rendering up at the top left, oddly. Um, oh, you know what it is? It's not actually rendering at XY. It's rendering at self.x and self.y. So we don't want to have that happen. We're going to just use X and Y. Self.x and self.y are not being assigned appropriately at this moment, and that's okay. We, we will worry about that later. But now you can indeed see, and this is very satisfying to look at, that all of the cards are rendering in the right place, in the right order. Now, they're not being shown card backings necessarily in the correct way. We can, we can work our way backwards and do that. We're going to essentially mark them all hidden and then mark the top card as visible. Now we'll solve the same purpose. But it's a nice, beautiful site. Everything seems to be going according to plan. Adam's saying it's looking very good, and as is saying that's awesome. I know, I, I, I'm very, actually I have not, never implemented this myself, so seeing it for the first time, I'm seeing it for the first time with all of you. So I, I, great, I get great joy out of making a game that I've never made before for the first time uh, like this. It's a, it's a very satisfying, fulfilling experience. Um, these cards aren't actually interactable, but the queen, I believe, is? No, the queen's not interactable either. Um, oh, the reason for that is we're not calling update on each card. Normally we, we do that and that's actually where the logic for moving the cards around takes place. Um, so we'll need to do that in order to move things, in order to move each individual card, um, but that in due time. Let's shift the cards down a little bit. I can't actually read what they say and that's kind of a problem. I'm going to go over here and where I actually render them. I'm gonna set this not to 10, but to 20. Let's see if that is a little better. There we go. That's pretty good. I can kind of see what the cards are. I can see um, what the suit is, which is very important. I can definitely tell, uh, well, with the exception of the jack. I actually can't see what the jack is. And so for that reason, I'm actually going to bump it up to 30 because it is an important consideration. There we go. That, I think, is close to perfect. We can see the suit for every card type, whether it's a, even a face card or a number card. Um, and we can see the number very well. The face and the, and the suit are all great. In which you're saying, pretty cool, it looks really close to what I play. That's awesome. I haven't played Solitaire myself for a long time. I think I was, actually, I think it was your age, Nate, last time I played Solitaire on a, my old Windows 95 computer back, way back in the day. So this is, this is moving along, right? We accomplished our first goal, which was to lay out all of our cards in the right order, right? We sort of did Mario, you know, the Mario sort of pyramid approach to things with the nested loop. Um, and this is a common pattern that you see all over the place. This isn't just in the context of Mario, I mean, it's most games, I would, I would even say, have some kind of two-dimensional aspect to them. Um, whether it's splicing 
textures or drawing tile maps or laying cards out in a grid or even in match three, which some students have just done. Adam might have done match three as well for, uh, fairly recently. Uh, you have two-dimensional layouts. It's unavoidable and very important to understand how those work. <laughs> Excuse me. Cool. Very satisfied at how that looks. And it's, it's different every time, right? Yep, completely different. It's wonderful. Um, now, it's not, it doesn't quite look how it's supposed to. What it's supposed to do is show only the top card. So let's do the, all of the cards below the top. Let's make those hidden and keep the very top card uh, set to not hidden. We can do that as by um, simply saying here, uh, not here, but in the generate tableaus, I can say um, if here we'll do it in here, right? So ensure topmost card is set to visible. So I can say if J is equal to I. Right, because that'll mean we're at the we're at the sort of the top layer of our loop, right? Then I can say I hate the fact that the auto the formatting is messed up. I have to tab like a million times now, um, but that's okay. They'll fix it. They probably already have fixed it. I probably should I probably should look and see if they have a, a, a an update I can pull from um, GitHub or something. Um, but I can say if J is equal to I, which will mean that. If we're at the end of each nested loop where we're generating or we're displaying the cards in our tableaus, um, uh, it's going to be stored at self.tableaus i uh, j dot hidden is equal to false. And then what we can do is just assume, do we want to do that? Uh, it doesn't really matter. At this point, it's kind of up to your taste, I guess. Um, We'll be explicit. We'll just say else self dot Or what we can do actually is we'll just say um, self dot i dot or i j dot hidden is going to be equal to whether j is equal to i. So now, mm, is that correct? equal to whether j is not equal to i. Yes. And what that does is that does have the effect that we are looking for of the cards stacking in the right way. And someone actually brought up an interesting point, which is uh, that I can leave the margin at 10 while the cards are face down, and 30 once they're face up, uh, because otherwise we might run out of room once we zoom in. And that's a good point. And actually, I think I'm going to do that. And what we can do is we can say um, local padding is equal to um, 160 time, or uh, local, we'll say local, yeah, we'll say local padding is going to be equal to um, Uh, self dot tableaus i dot j dot hidden and ten or thirty. And what that ends up, the problem with that is that now our uh, our shift is messed up. So we actually need to maintain a counter to where we're shifting everything by. So. What we can do, and by the way, this is how you do a ternary statement in Lua, use and or. So um, it basically evaluate this Boolean, and then we'll do this one if it's true, and 10, and or 30 if it's false. Um, just by the way that and and or evaluates the truthiness and falseness of values. Uh, I forget offhand the exact semantics. Um, but the pattern and or for a ternary operator, which you might have seen as um, colon uh, question mark colon in other programming languages, it's a pretty common thing to see. Now, the issue is if we assume it that way, then yes, things will work up until we get to the actual cards, and then those are calculated sort of absolutely, rather than relatively. They should be relatively calculated. And so 
instead, and this is where things are going to get kind of complicated, especially as you start moving cards around. Um, well, not necessarily, actually. This should, this should not be a problem because we will always have hidden cards at the bottom of the piles and then revealed cards towards the top. So this should work fine. Um, what did it say? Someone say, uh, oh, Andre was saying they'd still play Solitaire if Windows still came with it, but Candy Crush Soda Saga is taking its place. I think, I think I'd honestly prefer playing Candy Crush uh, at this point, but uh, this is a great academic exercise. I don't necessarily find myself playing or wanting to play Solitaire too much. Candy Crush, eh, not so much. I did play it when it first came out. We actually teach it in the games course that I teach. Um, you know, pick your poison. They're all good. It's all good stuff. Exercise your brain however you see fit. Um, let's go ahead and say local. We're going to store a variable. We're going to say local y pause is going to be equal to 160 and leave it at that. And then we're going to say um, y pause is uh, equal to y pause plus padding here. And then now we're going to say, um, oh, actually, we need to calculate it here. So y pause plus padding times j minus 1, just like that. So if we do that, and then we replace this with y pause, now that should, oh, that actually had an even worse effect. OK, that's not ideal. Why? Oh, because I need to do this, I think, after after this is done. Is this the case? Oh, wait. No, 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 no. I'm screwing that up. Y pause equals padding times j minus 1. I had that in the right. You don't want to add y pause to itself. Oh, geez. OK. Well, we do need to, we do need to, um, Um, one, so what we do, what we need to do is we need to say 160 plus padding times j minus 1. And so, oh shoot, why is that not working? Okay. Plus padding times j minus 1. Why is this not working? Interesting. Hmm. Um, let me see. Let me think about this. Should make a stream on Ruby. I've been dying to learn it, but I don't know where to start. Oh, man. I don't, actually don't know Ruby too well. Uh, I would have to think about maybe learning it, and I could, we could maybe do a stream on it in the future, but uh, more likely would be maybe somebody else knows the syntax. I am not 100% sure. Um, I am not 100% sure myself. Oh, wait. OK. Padding times. That's what it is. Right. OK. Because we're multiplying it by, so we're, we're basically calculating padding. We're still doing the same problem that we had before. Um, we just need to add padding. Just, just padding. That's it. And uh, and actually, we'll do it afterwards, like this. And now, oh, that's terrible. OK. Wait, padding. Oh, right. White, plot, white pause plus padding. There we go. Cool. Here we go. That was painful. I apologize. I often have slight issues. Um, and this is a lot of sort of like the um, sort of like futzing that goes on with game development in some aspects of like positioning things algorithmically. It can get a little bit odd. Um, get better at it over time. Um, certainly, it's possible to futz your way through anything, but that was slightly painful. But you know, we managed to make it work. Everything looks great. Yeah, why plus plus padding? Yeah, that was the, the problem that I had uh, that I was not seeing. But now, the good news is now when we shift to the next card, it doesn't shift after a face back card down the size that it would normally do for a face up card, right? Which is nice. And I think if we were to take this out, the padding should still be preserved in the right way. Yes, indeed it is. 
So cool, that works great. We have everything rendering in the right way. I don't care for this queen of hearts that is still, <laughs> excuse me, in my game. So I'm going to get rid of that. Let's go back to main, which is over here. So the queen of hearts, gonna get rid of that. Gonna get rid of that. And let's get rid of the actual declaration of it here. Cool. Things are starting to look pretty good, I would say. I'm, I'm, I'm a fan. Um, and everyone kindly is helping me out. Celio13, Debbie Wold, Sorrel CS. Thank you very much. And then Andre is saying, for those who aren't too familiar, Napoleon apparently came up with a bunch of variants of Solitaire while exiled to St. Helena. That's interesting. I, I am... <laughs> If Napoleon Bonaparte had Candy Crush, he'd never have escaped Elba. And I mean, who would have, who'd want to at that point, right? Um, okay. So we have our piles. Everything is rendering great. Everything looks awesome. Uh, another piece that we need to have is the deck. And the deck goes at the very top right. This is pretty easy, though. Uh, and really, we don't even need to necessarily do anything fancy with the deck. We could just literally draw a face-down card, and that would solve the same goal, right? So let's say, at this point, draw. I mean, we don't even need to be too fancy with it. I'll just say love.graphics.draw, G textures, card back at 490.50. And if I got that right, we do indeed now have sort of a visualization of the deck in its right place in the stock. And it's not uh, interactive at this point in time. It's not actually a deck. We're just simulating, providing the illusion of a deck being there, but you know, it, it, solves, its, it solves its purpose. So the next stage really is we need to start being able to click and drag cards around. Um, not just one given card, but any card on our game board. And we also need to preserve the child-parent relationships between cards that are on top of each other. And we need to actually start creating those relationships, because currently there are no relationships that take place. Now, the good news is the, the game board starts off in such a way that we don't need to worry about the relationships from the get-go. We just create the relationships as we build cards on top of each other. And this actually makes it kind of easy and nice. Um, but the first thing that we'll, we'll, we'll worry about is being able to take any of these cards and click and drag them one at a time. And we'll see if we don't run into any weird bugs along the way. I'm sure we will. Um, but what we can do is in game board, we should define an update function. And this update function will be where we actually check for mouse input, right? Just like we did for the, um, what was it? Uh, in card, the card class, I think is where we had it. I'm not entirely sure. Um, oh, and also game board render, do I have things? Um, oh, I guess, yeah, I guess I can take this function and just render, just set it in here. Actually, what I was gonna do is create a separate function, and this is good practice. So game board render tableaus. And let's go ahead and paste that, just like that. And actually call it self uh, render tableaus. So now in the render function, not only do we render the background first, but we also render the tableaus. We have them in separate functions. So this kind of maintains the grid, and this maintains the tableaus themselves, the logic. So everything is a little bit more modular, makes a little bit more sense. Uh, let's go ahead and implement the update function. So function game board update delta time. So what we want to do is basically basically just iterate through every single card that's not hidden. Um, well, every card that's not hidden, we can click and drag. And every card that's hidden in the top level of a tableau, we can right click to reveal. So let's do that. That sounds fine. Um, let's go ahead and say uh, iterate through all visible cards allowing mouse input. So for, um, we'll say for i is equal to one until the num of tableaus. Because remember, all of our cards are stored in our tableaus. So this is, this is where we're gonna need to iterate to actually provide input. So we're gonna access the cards. Each card we're going to check for input. Um, I can actually say, in our card class, I think we delegated some of this to it, right? 
So this, yeah, exactly. So in card update delta time, uh, so the card function itself, remember, it has an update function where it does this. So we can delegate to our card class for this, but we want to do it only when the card is, we want to only allow this input when the card is not hidden with this mouse input equal to one. So what I can do is say if button pressed one and, self, and not self.hidden, then allow me to click and drag the card around, right? So that's the change we need to make to card to make this work. And then back in game board, I can say, and remember, these are all stored as a table of tables. So I can say 4j is equal to 1 until the number of self.tableaus at i um, do self.tableaus at i at j uh, colon update delta time. And if everything went according to plan, I should be able to now click and drag cards. And unfortunately, I can't because we're not actually calling game board update from anywhere. And that's something that we need to do. So let's go to main.lua, which I believe is where we're doing all of this. And in update, so we're drawing the game board. But as you can see, we're not actually updating the game board. So let's do that. Let's go game board, update, delta time. Render it, click, and oops, <laughs> attempt to compare nil with a number. OK, card 22, which I think is probably what we just affected. Oh, OK. We are not actually passing uh, an x and a y. Wait a s oh, right. Yeah, they're not being assigned an x and a y. OK. Um, so what we can do is manually set them. Currently, what we're doing is we're sort of on the fly calculating their position by iterating through all of the tableaus. But we, what we can do instead is pre-allocate these x and y values and then just render them flat out in the game board class, rather than having to, every frame, figure out which x and y they should be um, given to. right? Uh, King440, dear streamer, did you work with the time series data? Uh, I'm not sh not sure what you mean by that. Do you mind clarifying? And Virtuoso7, thanks for joining. And Syrectian, thank you very much for the follow. Um, I think we're in a better position if we allocate the XY up front. I think that makes more sense. So hmm. Yeah, why don't we do that? So rather than in our game, rather than here where we're, you know, we figured out the Y pause and then we add 10 or 30 depending on whether it's hidden or whatnot, let's just do this in advance when we actually create the cards. We can easily just shift all of the, this rendering, lo this, um, this sort of positional logic back up to our constructor, right? So I can do something like this. I can say um, local Y pause is equal to 160. Actually, that goes over here. Y pause is equal to 160. And then get rid of that. And then I can say local padding is there, right? That goes inside the actual J loop, which is right here. So we're figuring out the padding in advance. And then this render bit right here is what we care about. So this is going to be the actual, the exposition is fine. Do you want to store that? Well, yeah, we, we can, that'll be just assigned to, exp, to a, an exposition. Um, and actually, this allows us to just get rid of that altogether because they're going to be storing their, their value, right? Just like that. So actually, we'll be able to, it'll just look like this when we're finished with it. And then up here, we want to say local x pause is equal to this value. And we're going to, in the constructor, 
Where's the card constructor? Ah, right. So we're doing self.deck draw. So what we're going to do instead is say local new card is equal to self.deck draw. New card dot x is going to be equal to uh, x pause. And new card dot y is going to be equal to y pause. Um, and then we want to set y pause to, we ended up adding to it the padding value. So, which was here, y pause equals y pause plus padding, right? And now if I'm correct, this should still work, maybe not. Game board line 25, which is, um, there was a nil, oh right, local padding is gonna be equal to, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is not going to work here. Oh, right, okay. This does complicate it a little bit because now we are, we don't have this hidden value that we've pre-calculated that we can then tweak. What we instead want to do is, what makes the most sense? We can, oh, well, we can just do this. We can say, um, well, okay. Padding is going to be equal. I mean, we could put it here, but this won't work because we need to specify the very first card's padding. No, we don't because padding is going to be set to zero by default. But that won't matter because padding gets assigned here. So if we say local padding is equal to zero, and then we say x, y. Sorry, just thinking aloud. Just want to refactoring the code sort of live um, to fit the other use case. So we're putting this all sort of up front. So everything is, I think, OK. Yeah, I think that this should work. Let me just make sure I'm not missing any nil references. New Cardi, that's not a thing. Game board line 28, which is new card dot y. Uh, card from deck on line 24. Um, wait, hold on. Attempt to index local card from deck a nil value. Interesting. Why is why is that broken of all things? That is weird. Unless we drew all 52 cards. Do I have a weird loop in here that's drawing all 52 cards? <laughs> this is interesting. Why? Okay. Wait. Attempt to index local card from deck. Card from deck, was, that wasn't even a part of the equation earlier. That doesn't even make sense. Uh, the only instinct that I have is that for some reason we're drawing more than 52 cards, but... Oh, we are. Shoot. That's what we're doing. Yep, we are. I was calling self.deck draw twice in the same block. That was my, my fault. Um, and now we don't have any cards. OK. Uh, so the padding isn't necessarily working here. Um, OK. That's strange. Oh, wait, is x pause? What's x pause being set to? I minus one. Yeah, that should be correct, right? And then the X pause. Oh, but we are, are we doing X pause plus padding? Yeah, we are. Or Y pause plus padding. 
Um, so we have a new, we're getting a new card. We're getting it from the deck. We're assigning it an explicit X, Y now up front. This is the problem that we were running into before. Um, we weren't assigning it an X, Y, so when we tried to render it, um, it wasn't working. And actually, in card.lua, are we referencing self.x in here? No, we're not. We're passing in an explicit xy. We probably want self.x and self.y here, which might be part of the problem. Yeah, that's what it was. We, were, we weren't referencing self.x and self.y. We were referencing hard-coded xy that we weren't passing in, and so it was assuming 0, because nil is effectively 0. Um, but now I can move 6 around which is pretty cool, and I can move seven around, and eight, and five, and six. So things are definitely progressing. So apologies for the hiccup there, but we have moved beyond um, having a static board, and now we do have an interactive board. And it's only the active cards. So if I try to click on this card, for example, because it's hidden, it's not actually letting me click on it. It's not, it's not interactive. If it's Hidden, what I want to be able to do is right click it and flip it over. And once it's flipped over, I want to be able to then move it around. Because when it's hidden, I'll then have that ability. It'll call update on the card, hidden will be true, then mouse.clicked1 will end up actually doing something. So uh, why don't we implement that, which should be a pretty easy thing to implement, actually. Um, if we're already up here where love.mouse.was button pressed 1, not self.hidden, I can say else if. And actually, one word, because if you do it as two words, it's a subtle bug where it thinks you're in a new scope, and then it'll expect another end, and it just causes problems. Um, just use else if if you want it to be aligned on the same uh, the same left uh, axis here. I can say if love dot mouse dot was button pressed two, which is right click, and self dot hidden, then um, self dot hidden equals false. Um, so I can do that, I can do that. I'm left clicking, if I, if I click this left click, nothing happens. But if I right click it, um, the problem is that right now, all of the cards register that right click on the same frame, so everything gets um, unclicked. What I want to do is check to see whether uh, I'm in the right zone, and that's what I need to do right here. So I need to just copy that right on over, tab that over. Uh, the tabbing is also bugged. Uh, tab that, and then this is all good. So rather than saying self.picked up is not self.picked up, I'm just going to say self.hidden is equal to false. Now, if I click that card, it's fine. If I click this card, it moves. If I left click a bunch of times, nothing happens. But if I right click, notice that it becomes um, hidden. And none of the other cards become hidden. So this is great. We've isolated the ability to take cards from any area. Now I can click and drag this card to my heart's content because it's not hidden anymore. So it's therefore manipulable. Um, however, if I right click this jack, as expected, both of the cards under the jack, uh, they became visible. And that is not behavior that we want. That is broken behavior. It is basically checking every single card in the stack and Basically, that's not, it's not what we want. Uh, we only want to check right click on the top most hidden card, and only if it's the top most card of the stack, not if it's a st a, the top most hidden card underneath a visible card. We don't want it to be interactive at all. Um, so what we can do is rather than update every single card, we can just update every single hidden card that's at the surface level of the stack. So if I go over to game board, and instead of updating every single card, what I can instead do is say, um, and I believe Lua does have break, so I can just break out of it. If I detect that um, What I want to do is I want to determine, first of all, that I've uh, found a card that's not hidden. So if I say local um, 
car, uh, card not hidden equals false, right? And so what first thing I can do is I can say if self.tablows at i j dot hidden, rather, if not self.tablows at i j is hidden, then I can say, uh, card not hidden is equal to true, right? We found a card. What I should do rather is say found card not hidden, and I can update this variable to say found card not hidden to be true. So um, check if we found a visible card abort checking for hidden cards later in the loop. So what this is basically going to do in my little uh, it looks like my um, mixer program thing. We just got a brand new sweet mixer. And uh, it has this iPad program that goes with it. But I think this iPad is on uh, automatic turn off or whatnot. So I had to reconnect it. But in any case, um, basically what I want to do is I want to say, have I found a visible card? If I have, I don't want to check any of the cards underneath, right? So what I can say is um, else, else if, whoops, rather, else if um, found card not hidden, then break, right? Because if I've, if I've found a card that's not hidden, I want to break out of this loop. I don't want to update it. I want to, I want to immediately end this loop and not worry about it. Um, and this will work for all of the hidden cards below a visible card. It won't update them. So I can test this. I can, I can go over here. I can click this card. I can right click. Uh, well, OK, that works, uh, unfortunately. OK, not as expected. Looks like my logic is wrong. Let's see. Um, if not self.tablos ij.hidden, then found. Oh, you know why? Because we're going in reverse order that will cause issues. OK, that complicates our algorithm slightly. So the algorithm actually works from bottom up, the iteration of our, um, of our cards. However, we want to update them in reverse order. We want to draw them in backwards order, update them in reverse order. Shoot. Um, that's actually not hard. No, we'll just up, yeah, updating them in reverse order is fine, as long as we keep drawing them in the right order. So what I can do is I can say for i is num tableau. Oh, rather, this doesn't matter. I can keep this going left to right. But I can say for j is equal to number of self.tableaus at i until 1 um, with a step of negative 1. So I'm actually working backwards through the tableau from the from the uh, from the very top level down, uh, checking for the logic there. Now, if I do this, if I'm not mistaken, I can't right click anymore. It's not letting me right click to reveal any of the cards that are in that table. However, I can left click to reveal a card, and if I right click here, uh, it still won't work. It looks like, which is interesting, but that's okay. Um, I'm trying to think, is the logic such that it would account for the top card at this moment in time? I'm not 100% sure yet. I feel like it should have at least revealed the top card, right? Am I mistaken? So move the ace, right click. No? I mean, we have the behavior we want, which is that we can't right click um, underneath the top card and have them all get revealed. But it's not revealing even the top card. So let's see. Um, So we're saying if 
Okay, we're going through the, t oh wait, because we're moving, oh right, 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 right. We are still manipulating the tab, it's not taken off of the tableau, that's the thing. The card isn't being removed from the tableau, it is still part of the tableau, it's just not visible. Um, it's not visibly stacked on the same pile. That's the problem. We still have this Tableau data structure. We're just, we've just separated the rendering, but we haven't actually separated the data structure. We haven't taken that top card and allocated it to a different Tableau. That's what we need to fundamentally do for this algorithm to work backwards. So, do we want to implement this yet or? I feel like if we were to implement the rendering correctly with the not taking the cards out of the tableau, this would fundamentally actually set us backwards. So, yeah, so rule CS, the visible card's still in the tableau. That's correct, yeah. Um, the next logical step is implementing it such that by clicking a card off of the tableau, it removes it from the tableau and maybe allocates it to another data structure. Um, well, this is a tricky thing too because the card, if we update, if we do all of the update logic from within our card class, the card doesn't maintain a reference to its tableau. Should it maintain a reference to its tableau? I'm always a little uneasy about sort of putting, like having all your objects sort of have a reference to all your other objects. Everything's just kind of this net. Um, and it feels a little bit anti-proper object-oriented programming design. It's something that's hard to escape with games because so many things rely so intimately on having this update render relationship. So many things have, so many things need to talk to each other to interact and to get, uh, to get information and to render things correctly. It's a hard thing to, to completely solve. One thing we could do is sort of have like a self dot, um, we would have like a self dot um, like table or table pool, I guess. And this would just be like a general purpose tableau for just for, as we, just so we demonstrate the ability to right click new cards and move them around to other places. Um, and so this table pool will be kind of a catch all, I guess. Um, so let me think. We could allocate it, we could, we could program it such that when we click, when we reveal, so we could have it, well, because if we're testing it within the card class, we need a reference to the tableaus, which are in the game board class. Um, hmm. <laughs> this is where it gets a little messy sometimes. But let's figure this out. So And welcome to programming from scratch. These are the kinds of things, the kind of situations we run into sometimes. Uh, live engineering. But I want to click on a card. We could just go straight to implementing it such that we can't program, or we can't, uh, sorry, we can't move cards unless we move them to a another tableau, but there's the thing. Then we need to keep track of whether they're in a movement state. If they're in a movement state, which actually, no, they, we're already doing that with picked up, which is fine. Um, but we need to s sort of have a central picked up. So we can only pick up one thing at a time, and that's going to be either 
Um, well, actually, well, if we, we are maintaining that parent-child relationship, it's not a big deal. So... First place to start is, well, there are multiple places we could start. I don't like the idea of us programming it such that we can just move cards willy-nilly right off the bat and engineer around that because it's not even part of the game. That would be more for testing purposes and we're not really concerned about that, I don't think. So I think what we should do and this is the harder part, is go aim towards a moving cards between piles system. Um, and we can even begin to enforce that cards follow the right, um, the right sort of conditions for being put into a new pile. So, yeah, let's do something like that. Now the only thing that complicates that again, like I said, is the cards are maintaining reference to their, to their input basically. And so I'm almost inclined to say we shift the input to the game board for the cards. And then that way we can only maintain, a re we only need to maintain a reference to moving one card at a time. And then if we update all the cards, all the cards Essentially, what all their update is going to look like is going to be something like this. It's going to be um, it's going to be self dot x is equal to parent dot x, and self dot y is equal to parent dot y. Update card based on its parent. And uh, thank you very much on uh, any mesh sing for the follow and emotive nom <laughs> emotive non Amazon. Thank you very much for the follow. That's a, some tricky names. Um, this is effectively going to be the end goal for our card update function. And uh, well. It might be more complicated than that. It might end up being something of the form, if self.picked up, then self.x is equal to parent.x, self.y is equal to parent.y. And what this is going to do, this, this therefore is going to, it's going to propagate picked up to all of the children of a given, um, of a given um, card. Or we're going to probably have some sort of very simple recursive function that does this. So we'll say something like um, function card pickup. And we're going to say if self dot. Um, and so actually, it makes sense then to have a reference to all of the children. So it does make sense to have child reference. So we say if self dot child, then. Um, well, first of all, what we do is we say self.picked up is equal to true, right? Pick, going to pick up the card. We want to maintain that state. And then we're going to say if self.child, which means we have a child, which means this needs to therefore be a thing. If self.child is equal to nil, then we want to essentially call self.child pick up, right? And so this will just recursively go down until we reach the end of the cards that have no more children. Um, this, it, this seems sound to me. Um, and then there's going to be two parts to this. It's going to say, if self.picked up, then, and then we're, here's where we're going to say, basically, if um, self.parent is equal to nil, then, right, because if it has no parent, we're basically just going to follow the mouse. So we're going to say, um, we're going to say, 
Oh, basically this, actually. Yeah, we're just gonna do this. Copy this over here, like that. So basically, if we're picked up, but we don't have a parent, that means we're the card that we're clicking and dragging around. That's the parent level card. So if we're picking up an entire stack of cards, that's the bottom card. And all of the children are on top of it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say, if we're picked up, but we don't have a parent, we're just gonna move us around with the mouse cursor. But else, else will mean that we do have a parent. And uh, thank you very much to uh, Nooth Gang. Um, if we do have a parent, then we're just going to set our self.x equal to our parent.x, whoops. And our parent.y, or our y equal to our parent.y plus, uh, we'll say plus 30, right? So that way we get a stacking effect when we move our cards around. So this will preserve the distance between all of the cards, um, but the parent will be at the top level and that will follow our mouse around. So we can therefore move a whole stack of cards and uh, click and drag them as we see fit. And then um, another important thing that we need to do is say, um, and we'll have a, a function for place down. And place down is going to be a little bit trickier because this is where we're going to need to actually, we're going to need to know where to put it in the right tableau. Excuse me. Whether it's a tableau, um, whether it's a, whether it's one of the top decks, well, one or the other. These are important things to take into consideration. And I'm even wondering whether we should have a Tableau class. Um, maybe not at this point. It might be more engineering hassle than it's worth. But um, when we place the card down, we effectively need to, well, basically what we'll do is we'll say if um, self.parent is equal to nil, then well, actually, this is more complicated than that. These, these cards are actually going to be shifted around. Um, hmm. <laughs> if, we take, if we take as input, and this is a more functional way to think about this, if we take as input a game board, right? we assume that we're going to just get the game board as an argument to our function for placing the card down. This is sort of how you get around objects having references to other objects or, or fields that are other objects. You pass in what you need as arguments to your function. So in this case, I can say card, place down, a game board. Game board, I'm going to actually pass into the function instead of just having game board reference in each card. right? So we don't necessarily need to have a game board reference stored for each card. We'll just you, you will just get a reference to it when we need it, when we care about it. We'll, we'll, we'll pass it into the function for placing the card down. Um, so if the self.parent is equal to nil, so this is where we get into the, or rather, this is where we should say if self.child is equal to nil. And in, in this particular instance, we can check to see if placing in Tableau or winning pile um, else we want to um, check to see if placing in um, <laughs> oh actually we're only going to care about um, whether a parent is equal to nil. We're not going to worry about every child card getting um, placed down because that'll just get too complicated. All the cards are going to check at the same time for whether they should get placed somewhere. We're just going to check whether our child is nil or whether our parent is nil. So whether we're a card that's by itself or um, well, actually, and to be fair, um, it needs to be if self.child is equal to nil and self.parent is equal to nil. Is that the case? Um, yes. So if self.child is equal to nil and self.parent is equal to nil, so this is a card by itself. This is important, so this is where we're going to check. Whoops. Check to see if placing in the tableau or the winning pile. This is where we can place a single card by itself. Else if 
self.child is equal to nil and self.parent, uh, or rather, if self.child is not equal to nil and self.parent uh, is equal to nil, then what this is going to do, otherwise only worry about placing a top level card. We're going to check to see whether we have some children, some child, but no parent. And this will mean that we're, it'll effectively refer to a card that we've clicked that has cards stacked on top of it. That is a parent card with, that is a, uh, that is a parent card with children. Um, it does not have any, any parent itself, therefore um, we only are worried about just it and placing all of its children, therefore, with it onto another Tableau pile. And so I apologize if I'm losing anybody. Uh, <laughs> Newth King, wow, David Malin looks a lot younger. Uh, I, I don't claim to be David Malin. Um, but uh, if anybody has any questions about the logic that I'm going through here, definitely let me know because I realize that the mechanics of this might be getting a little complicated and it sort of is a little bit complicated. This might be one of the meteor projects we've worked on. Um, and if I'm going too fast, I apologize. Uh, I'm trying to hopefully get in as much as I can before four today. Um, but this will continue in a future part, of course, if we, well, we don't finish, which we're probably not gonna finish today. I did sort of in my head plan at least three streams for this. Um, but let me know if, you're, if you have any hangups or any questions so far on what we've talked about because I realize we're moving very quickly. Um, but we are checking just these two conditions, these two very specific cases of whether our card is by itself. We can check the tableau or the, tab, uh, the winning piles or the tableau. And then we wanna check um, whether we are a top level card with children. And we're going to place that down only in tableaus, not in, um, uh, not in winning piles. Place only in tableaus, not winning piles. Cool. So apologize for the complexity. It is a, it is a relatively uh, complex set of um, conditions that we're checking for. Maybe not. Maybe I'm overthinking it. But um, there is a bit of a bit of work we have to do to get this to work well. Now, um, the game board, since we're passing it in as a function, or into our function as a parameter, we can start to use it to get the information for the tableaus and the winning piles that we care about. So we can reference those bits of information here in card placed down because we're passing game board in to our function. Um, now, I don't know if I'm necessarily ready, if we're necessarily ready to do that. Let's just make sure this actually still runs, which it does. I can move this card around. Um, and if I do that, I can try to place that card down. Now, what that ended up having the effect of doing it, it would, first of all, it didn't work. Um, uh, one of the other things that we should probably take into consideration is if we click on another card, we shouldn't pick up the card. We shouldn't pick up another card because that's we essentially kind of need a global sort of card is being picked up state to allow us to know when we can pick up a card, right? I think we do. I think we I think we really do need this. Um, so what I'll do is I'll I'll make a new field. I'll say self dot picked up card or card picked up. We're going to set that to false first off. Um, and then in card class itself, I think that's where we're actually identifying whether that card is picked up. And now we have a card picked up game board field and a card picked up per card field. And this is sort of complicated because there are cards, multiple cards that can get picked up. But we want to also preserve the fact that we're picking up a card so that we don't pick up other cards when we left click or when we set a card down. So let's maybe pass into card update a, we can pass in our game board to card here as well. At this point, it's almost like, why not just have a game board reference in every card at this point? But uh, we'll try to keep it as um, lightweight and non, I forget the term, um, but there's, there's a term for it, for having sort of references of everything all together. It's just bad practice. 
Um, so what we'll do is we'll pass in game board in this case to the card uh, to the cards update function, and here we can check to see whether we are picking up a card. And we can do that down here. Um, So we're toggling the states currently. So this is where we're going to need to get add a little bit more logic. We basically need to say, ensure we're not already picking up a card. So I can say if game board dot rather if not game board dot card picked up, then. This uh, indentation is killing me a little bit. That's OK. There we go. Then uh, we, can toggle, we can toggle whether it's picked up or not if we're not already picking up a card. Actually, is that even correct? Because at this point, um, hmm. <laughs> uh, We can say, if not gameboard.card picked up, then self.picked up is not self.picked up. This is a toggle, but we don't want a toggle for every card. At this point, we just want to check to see whether we're not picking up a card currently. And so then we can say self.picked up is equal to true, and gameboard.card picked up is equal to true. Then we can say, uh, else if self dot picked up, then uh, self dot picked up is equal to false, and game board dot card picked up is equal to false. So it's a more complicated toggle. Let's see if this works. Uh, uh, sixty-two. Are we not passing in game board? We are, right? Where that where's that called from? That was called from card sixty-two. Um, oh, we're not passing it into the card function. Right. Uh, let's do that. So in our update function, we're going to go down to where we're uh, updating every card, which is right here, and we're gonna pass in self because we are we are self is the game board in this context. Now let's try this. I have my card. If I click this. Now notice that I clicked on the card below, and I can only pick up one card at a time. Um, but due to the fact that the tableaus are all oddly sort of stacked and layered, now we get some interesting artifacts. Right Now we can realize that these cards, when we pick them up, they need to have a different rendering order, actually. So these, this is a little bit more complicated than we originally might have thought, which is OK. This sort of thing happens. Um, now, this, this one on the right, for example, is above all of these because it gets drawn last. Remember, we're drawing all the cards from each tableau left to right. So we're drawing this four first. So it's actually going underneath all of these cards, right? So if I click and drag this around, now it is getting drawn. Um, it's still getting drawn first. It still thinks that it's right basically in this tableau, the way that we've structured the data, right? So the card that we're currently picked, that we're picking up, one, we should probably get rid of it from the tableau that it's in. And then two, defer the rendering of it to a different place outside of that nested loop. We need to have sort of a, a card that's currently being picked up, or a card stack that's being picked up. And um, this is OK. Trying to think, um, just moving the cards themselves, since they're references, it might end up duplicating the cards. And if we remove it, it might actually end up deleting it from the original deck or original tableau altogether. So it's a little, there's a few pieces here that are a little bit messed up. The important thing is, though, that we can only pick up one card at a time. Thankfully, it's a little bit buggy currently, but we won't really have to worry about this too much because 
eventually we're only going to we're going to have a very restricted um, set of situations in which we can pick up cards. We won't ever run into rendering bugs like this. We won't we won't run into render ordering. Uh, sorry, won't run into pickup ordering issues like this. Everything is going to be very well defined. Um, but we are going to um, need to get there first. We're going to need to make a few changes to our logic. First among them being any card that we pick up from a tableau needs to have priority rendering over everything else on our board, which means that we need to essentially take it out of the tableau, out of the data structure that it's in, probably cache where it was before so that if we misclick, it goes back to its prior position. That's an important feature we should probably think about. Or at least minimally not allow clicks in wrong positions and force that the, the user put its, puts it in the right position before we allow them to pick up another card or another set of cards. Um, and then once we do click it and put it into the right tableau, it needs those cards need to go into the right data structure. We need to make sure there are no extra copies of cards being made and no cards are being removed um, and deleted completely, as in uh, we don't have references to cards, whereby when we remove a table or when we remove a card reference, it deletes all of the... Uh, but we remove a card from a table, it doesn't remove it and its references, they're, they're, uh, therefore uh, getting rid of all the cards, period. We have a few specific issues that we need to be conscious of here. And uh, separately, can we make any moves here? I don't. doesn't look like we can. Uh, we need to also implement the ability to draw cards from our stock. Right? We need to be able to click a card here and get a new card here. And we could do this forever, by the way. Uh, up until the car, up until the deck is drawn. And this is where we're gonna need to change how the deck is also rendered. So as we can tell, this is a fairly meaty project. I've got a very uh, sizable set of problems to solve, but we can definitely solve all of them. <laughs> Let's first start by taking the card from the tableau and shifting its render priority. Why can't we have a tableau position in a card, says Saul CS. We could do something like that. Um, that just gives us more stuff that we have to manage rather than just being able to click and drag stuff on top of other things. Because um, once we click once we click a card and we get its tableau position, um, it's not really super meaningful to even have the information, I would necessarily say. Um, a lot of a lot of this logic is kind of just inferred. in that particular, case, the ordering kind of just helps us out. We don't need the numbering, the explicit numbering in that situation, unless you want to clarify what you, what you mean more specifically. I don't, but I don't think having a, an index necessarily associated with each card will help us here. Um, I think a lot of that, I think the, its position uh, sort of in the data structure itself is the important factor. Um, Let's go ahead and when we, when we end up getting the card picked up from the deck, like I said, we're going to need to make it so that it gets taken out of the data structure, doesn't get removed, but maybe gets put into a temporary staging area. So what I can do is I can say in game board, maybe I'll have self dot picked up cards is going to be equal to a table. And if it's a, uh, if we're just picking up a single card, this table will just be one card large, right? Doesn't matter. If we're picking up an entire set of cards, then this is important. This, the, the table will actually store every card and we can then render them in the right order based on their parenting. Um, So what we're going to do is once we pick up a card in, and again, this is in card.lua, then here we can actually, using that reference to the game board, we can add this card and all of its children to the game board, sort of that temporary staging ground. And then the important thing that we can then do actually is, um, and these should be put in the right order too. So this will work if we just add all of the children 
in the right order. So if we take the parent and add all of the children sequentially, we can then render all of the cards sequentially and that will have the correct effect. So let's go ahead and first in game board, let's write where we're gonna end up rendering this, which is gonna be here. Uh, underneath render tableaus, we can say self render um, picked up cards. And let's write the function. Game board render picked up cards. And by the way, there are a million ways that you could do this. This just happens to be one way that I'm constructing. Again, uh, per Cerule um, and other folks, definitely if you have ideas or questions, ask them, provide them, um, and we can make this more of a collaborative effort. But this is me at this point just kind of figuring things out as we go, um, the way I think about solving the problems. Very open to other people's ideas. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to say 4i is equal to um, 1 up until the number of self.pickedup cards do love, or rather, um, and if we're updating the position of the cards, then this should be fine actually, because they're going to have the picked up flag associated with them, right? So we can then just do self dot picked up cards I render. And this should actually work. I say that, but I feel like I've gotten that wrong several times already. So in my mind, I'll say that that should work, but we'll, we'll, we'll soon see whether that will indeed work. Um, those self.picked up cards should all have the um, picked up flag set to true on them. The, this flag right up here, which again we're checking for in our update. And remember, if they are picked up, they will look to see whether they have any parent cards. If they have parent cards, they will get uh, the x, y of their parent and then shift their rendering position down by 10 pixels. And we will set the, if the is the parent, remember, it will itself get assigned the mouse position. So that should work. Now, if we, the, the question that we then run into is once we pick up all the cards, once we render them in a different position, Oh, oh, another thing we have to also consider, which I just realized, we need to actually remove those cards from the tableau they were just in, right? Because they'll be in um, two places at once. They'll be rendered in two places at once at this point. I think we can demonstrate this. This, uh, oh, maybe not. Um, let's see. Uh, game board, render picked up cards. Oh, because we aren't adding them to picked up cards yet, I don't think, are we? No, I don't, think we, I don't think we're adding them to picked up cards yet. So that's another thing that we're going to have to do. Um, if you go to over here, we can say um, what we actually need to do, I just realized, we created that pickup function, which was a recursive function, recall. Um, which propagated the picked up flag to all of its children. So what we can say is if self dot parent is equal to nil, then self pick up. And I believe what this will do is just remember set picked up to true, right? Which is here. But then it will also propagate it to its children. And right now, we aren't establishing any parent-child relationships. That's going to be one of the next parts of the stream. We're going to need to do that in order for things to work the way we want them to. Um, and then we can say this here, like that. So gameboard.card picked up is set to true. And. Another thing that we're going to need to do is when a card is in the tab below and it's below other cards, we can't really click on, well, hmm. We have to restrict our window of which we can click the cards because what normally you're only allowed to do is click on 
for example, this green part here, this would be where I could click, if that were another card that was revealed, I could click that card, but I could also click this card. So what we need to do is actually do a reversal on the, on the, on the tableau. We need to check for a collision in reverse order, not in, not in front order. Um, because if we do it in front, if we do it from back to front order, we could end up actually picking up the very back cards when we actually meant to pick up the front cards, right? But this is fairly easy to take care of. We can do this just by ensuring that we're, and actually, I think we're already doing it in the right order. Let's go to game board. Are we doing this in the right order? We are rendering, we are updating in reverse order, correct? Yes. So actually, yeah, wait, no, we're not. Um, yes, yes, we are. Sorry, I was looking at this loop. It's this loop that we care about. Since we are actually in reverse order from the back to the front, checking for um, clicks, this will pick up the back cards before it picks up the front cards. Now, the problem is that there's overlap. So what we actually need to do is change our collision box for the front card. The back cards, all we, we only want to worry about the top part of them. We only want to click on the very top layer. We don't want to do that for, um, for the very front card. The very front card should have a, hit, a collision box. That's the entire card um, collision box, as in where the mouse is being checked for collision-wise. So that'll be. And that will be the, uh, sorry, that'll be in card. That will be here, where, uh, where is it? Um, it is here. Essentially this, this bit of code. Um, rather than checking for card width and card height, we're going to check to see whether it has any children. If it has no children, then yes, we can, we can check its entire collision box, its entire card width and height. But if it has children, we need to check only the very top 30 pixels, right? The, the, because that's the number of pixels that we're offsetting it by 30. So we'll, we'll check that. Um, which we can do here. We can say if self.child is equal to nil, then, which it should be, then we'll do all of this. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Uh, well, actually, what we'll end up doing, we'll, what we'll say is, um, OK, here's what we'll do. Rather than duplicate our loop, we're going to confine y bounds checking based on parenting. Um, smaller hitbox for when cards are behind other cards. So. If self.child is equal to nil, we'll, we'll say, um, uh, we'll do local y, y check, or I guess y bounds, is going to be equal to card height, right? We'll set this to y bounds. And then if self.child is equal to nil, or not equal to nil, we'll assume that we can check the card height. But if it has a child, if this card has a child, what I'll end up doing instead is set y bounds equal to 30. And what this is going to do is, depending on whether it has children or not, it's going to either check the top 30 pixels or the entire card, right? And so this helps us get the right, click the right card, get the right, uh, you know, the right specific card that we care about. If we're clicking on the top edge of a card, we only want that particular specific card. Well, actually, is that even going to work? Um, Actually, I'm just realizing now, I think in that case, we have to check for collisions going front to back. Oh, wait, no, that's, that's not necessarily true, no. If we click on this, right, yeah, because the back card's only going to check these top 30 pixels, so if I click here, yeah, it won't trigger a collision. Correct. OK, so everything is sound. I'm, I'm not going insane. At least I don't think I am. Fingers crossed. Um, so that's, that's working. Uh, let's test it, make sure we can actually still pick things up. Yes, we can. Pick things up. Yes, we can. Things don't, still don't render correctly, but that's OK. We're going to fix that. We're going to set in game board. Um, well, we're going to we're actually back to um, the card class. 
where we actually set things to being picked up. Self.pickup, we're going to do that. Self gameboard.card picked up is equal to true. And then we want to end up actually removing the card from the right tableau. Hey, how's it going? Hey, hey, everyone. We have a very special guest today. Can I just pop on to say hi? Yeah, sure. Here's a view of what's going on. So everybody in the chat, shout out to David. So we're currently implementing uh, Solitaire, we're doing a little bit of some nitty gritty stuff. But here's what we have going so far. This is like the longest implementation of Solitaire I think I've ever seen. Oh, yeah. This it, is what, day six? <laughs> it feels like day six. <laughs> Now we have, uh, we have cards moving around today and we have the piles of stuff, but we're currently implementing it such that, as you can see, for example, if we pick up card number three, mm -hmm. because these are all being rendered left to right, you can probably guess what's gonna happen, this card actually gets rendered below all of these cards. Oh. So when a card is in a, in a uh, state of being shifted around, what it actually needs to happen is a separate rendering order needs to be created. Interesting. Oh, so that's kind of like in CSS Z index for folks who are familiar. Yeah. Um, what we're doing in this case is more hackish because beca because we know we have a very limited set of operations we can mm -hmm. apply. This card, uh, if we're we can only move one card or a card pile at a time. So if we're if we want to move, for example, any card at mm -hmm. once, we can just shift it to a different rendering order altogether, which would be kind of like a Z okay. order, but it's essentially just getting allocated to a different table. I got some got some folks saying hello as well. Well, this is nice. kind of like then Photoshop and Keynote and PowerPoint, where there's this notion of a vertical axis, like yeah. you can put objects on top of other objects. Exactly. What is it? Bring to front or send to back? Yeah. So this card, for example, will render on top of this one um, because this came. This one came from the fourth set of cards. This one came from the third set of mm -hmm. cards. Very exactly. nice. Yeah. I'm so. taking off shortly. <laughs> well, and, oh, can I just say hello to uh, Andre here and Sarux and Bella and uh, oh, I look a lot younger than Colton. That's good. <laughs> this is my uh, adult clothes today they, too. They, they wrote that earlier because I think they were saying I, I, maybe I sounded like you or something. Oh, really? That was before okay. you came in. Yeah. Well, I don't want to interrupt. I just wanted to say hello. I'll hop back on the chat. But really good to see everyone. Thank you for tuning in as always, and can't wait to see uh, the game be played ultimately. Cool. Awesome. Thanks All so right. much for popping by. Yeah. Appreciate it. Um, so yeah, that's we were in the process then of establishing that secondary sort of rendering location. Hello, Irene. Good to see you. Um, and Adam and Kavabanga and Asli and everybody who's saying hello. Um, it's been a little bit lighter of a chat today. I'm guessing that might be because it's a little bit um, more nitty gritty and maybe I'm going a little bit fast. Um, speaking to that, I need a little bit of uh, mouth lubrication. But um, essentially the next part of this puzzle that we're solving is getting the card from the table, sort of figuring out which table it's in. In Boston, Mass, I just finished my Snapple. It's very appropriate because we are very close to Boston, actually. Um, getting the card from the right table and putting it into a separate location. Now, this is a little bit tricky just because, again, we don't have a reference to each individual tableau within the card itself. And this might be where we have to start thinking, oh, okay, do we in fact need to store whether a card is in any given tableau so that we can get rid of that card from its data structure? So we can um, sort of take it out temporarily and maybe re-put it in later when we need to. Um, the duck though saying uh, ETA on the next code review. Um, good question. I think probably next week is what it's looking like for the next code review. Um, the, unfortunately, it's a bit of a busy week for folks. Um, unfortunately, David and Brian both have uh, uh, conflicts and are unable to come. But I would expect one either next week or the week after, and we'll update the schedule to reflect as much. And we'll talk about when it might be the most ideal. But we do enjoy the, the, the code reviews. Those are a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, I'm realizing here that the tableaus the fact that we don't have a reference to it in the card, and that's where we're doing the update to sort of you know, bring it out, it's causing a slight problem. Um, although, 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 we're checking, we're doing the actual, um, from within the game board, we are looking through the tableau to see or to actually update, sorry, rather to, to update the card class or the card object, we are going in our game board class through each tableau and therefore getting a reference to them. It's worth maybe I could just pass in 
self.tableaus i there, right? So the card takes a tableau as an argument to its update function. And as a result, now we do have the ability to sort of piece out the card and, and also, therefore, its children, if, if that's what we need to do. Um, and then this will help us you know, restart the rendering order. So I think that might, might end up being what we actually do. So let's go ahead. In here, where we have self.pickup. Um, Hmm. The problem is the recursion of the pickup. Because when we pick up just this top card, um, I guess we could just trigger the tableau. I guess we could trigger. We could just call table.remove, actually. And that would work. Yeah, we could do that. OK, that's what we'll do. We'll just say pick up also gets the tableau. And what we'll do is we'll say pick up here, passing in the tableau, which we passed into our update function. So things are a little bit, you know, argue, we're passing a lot of arguments back and forth, but at least we're not maintaining too many sort of object references, which is arguably better. Um, we can then, in our pick up function, actually maintain this removal of the card from the tableau. I'll say tableau dot, or sorry, table dot remove tableau. Um, and actually what this does, if we just call it as is, it'll just remove the card from the tableau. So we can do that. And then this will call that, this exact same bit of code will execute for all of its children as well. OK. So then if I click this, as expected, it deletes the card, because this was one of the worries that I had before. And that is that when you table.remove, it's just removing it from the table altogether and getting rid of that information. What we want to do really is copy it to the game board's temporary staging area, which is what we can do, exactly. Um, and so we'll pass in the game board here. So let's write a function here, just because this, uh, this function is getting a little bit complicated. So what we'll do is pick up the card, flagging it as such, then remove it from the game, uh, from the tableau in which it is. Uh, make a copy of this card and um, add it to the game board's staging um, hand. And the staging hand is just where we, where we can move the card around before we click it and, and actually place it down somewhere concrete. When we do that, it's going to essentially take the staging area cards and then put them into a tableau. It's going to inject them. Um, and as a result of that, the staging area is going to just kind of be filled back and forth um, with something different uh, at different times. But um, Cavabonga, do you think all of this would be easier to code on something non-Lua? Uh, probably not, honestly. It's, I mean, yeah, to Andre's point, Unity is, Unity is pretty good, especially for the debugging. So Cavabonga does have a, a good point. Um, debugging in Lua isn't the best. You can do this in certain IDEs. Um, I mean, certain things are kind of trickier to debug. Uh, it depends. It, it really depends. The debugging is arguably not great. There are certain plugins that you can get that will let you um, debug in Love 2D. Love 2D debugging. Uh, so there's this, which lets you actually run sort of a REPL, a debugging REPL, which is kind of cool. Um, and there, it's a little bit convoluted. And part of the reason, too, is we would have a lot of extra code and boilerplate, and we need to teach how to, all this stuff works. Um, but I would say, if you're interested in a good debugging setup, I would use Zero Brain Studio, which is an IDE that has Love 2D support. Because I've heard excellent things, and I've had several students use the framework to good success. I personally am not a huge fan of it. I would rather, 
use uh, printing and um, recursive outputting of tables and stuff, looking at the memory, looking at what's going on, um, that resounds better with me personally. Um, in the context of Unity, I'm a big fan of Unity's debugging, but even in Unity, I still use echoing a lot for debugging because sometimes that's just all you need to do is you need to look at the right value and make sure the right value is getting set. Um, but different people have different mileage. There are really cool integrated debugging tools in Love2D. So if, uh, for example, like Love2D um, debugging console. I saw this at some point um, and I was a big fan. I just gotta figure out which library it is. It's a library. Um, let me see. There's Lovebird. I have heard of Lovebird, which is a debugging console for the web browser. This is kind of cool. Um, this is interesting. It actually lets you look at your entire stack of, of variables, but even still, you're still seeing functions and tables and stuff, which isn't necessarily all that interesting. Um, so recursive outputting of these things, of um, less functions but more tables, is, I, I think, ultimately a, a really good way to debug. And that's what we did last time, actually, in util.lua, if you look at that. We have a function called dump, which just dumps a table recursively. And so if you have complex data structures where the data is getting manipulated in weird ways, then yeah, you can use that. And I think that's a, an ideal way to go about doing it. Um, and that, that resounds well with me. Check out Zero Brain Studio if you're interested in a really good um, Love2D based debugging tool though. Unity plus Visual Studio is really cool for debugging, but I'd argue its main strength is being a strongly typed language. Yes. That's, that's true, and that was one of the, the things that we brought up earlier, was whether you're in Python or Ruby or Lua or some other dynamic language, debugging at compile time isn't a thing. So you don't have this kind of safety net that Java and other languages give you and you sort of overlook or at least take for granted until you get out into the dynamic language space. Um, it's a trade-off that you make for not having to put up front as much effort to get things rolling fast. Um, and also having to compile and run stuff in that, uh, that sort of more rigid loop of development, it's different. I, I'm a big fan of dynamic languages, but there are times where I do wish that I do have, that I did have compiled um, you know, functions and objects to at least sort of say, oh, you know, you can't be passing this data this way, or that's a null reference, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, should probably fix that, or, you know, or the wrong type of data is getting passed around. You don't see that in a dynamic language like Lua at all. Um, that's one of the things that really helps when you're using, especially with polymorphic data, yeah, that's something that you can really get a, a bit of help with in a context like uh, C Sharp or uh, Java. Um, but again, Zero Brain Studio, check that out. Big fan of, uh, of that. Even though I don't use it myself, I think based on what I've seen but with my students have used it, it looks really good. Um, okay, so we have currently removed the bit of information that we care about. Kavabonga, you're welcome. We removed the, t the uh, card from the table, but we need to actually copy it and put it into our, um, into our staging area, along with all the children. So, and I'm actually not sure if Lua makes this easy to just move, Lua, move objects between tables. Uh, let me see. Oh, that's, oh, okay, that's cool. I've never even tried to do that. The three arguments, though, I'm not 100% sure why there's three here. Okay. Oh, I see. New being the new index. Table.remove being the, is that the right argument? Oh, Lua 5.3 has table.move, but I think Love2D uses Lua 5.2, Love2D Lua version. I'm not 100% sure, actually. Oh, yeah, Lua 5.2, I think. I mean, this was a long time ago, but I don't think they've updated. Um, Love 0.10.2 Lua version. Uh, actually, I'm using Lua 11, I think. Uh, Love 11. Love 11 Lua version. <laughs> What's love got to do with it, somebody says. Love that. Uh, yeah, so it doesn't have table.move, but it looked like uh, we can actually table move. 
in in Lua. Whoops. <laughs> table move probably give me references to people moving physical tables. Not what I want. Um, oh, psh, that's not what I want. Table shift um, Lua, or rather um, move elements. Uh, here we go. Actually, it was this thread that we were just looking at. So table dot insert, which is what we've been using, takes in a table. This new, and I'm not, I don't remember the arguments offhand, but this is development. You know, Googling things constantly is part of the struggle. Table dot insert takes in, okay, so it takes in the table, um, the, the index, and then the actual value. Okay. So what we can do then, okay, that makes things actually easier, quite a bit easier. So we, right, because table.remove returns the value, uh, of course, of course. Um, and if you don't do anything with the value, obviously that'll get you know, garbage collected like it did earlier. It'll get removed. It won't be a thing. Um, but no, this is great. So in our game, was it card? Yeah, it was card. So this, this is what this is right here. So we're going to do table.insert into the game board dot cards picked up, was it? Card, uh, picked up cards. Uh, picked up cards, whoops. We're going to insert that, and then we're going to remove, uh, actually, we're just going to remove the last thing from the tableau. Oh, this is. Wait, no, that's not the right order. Um, we just want to remove always, always going to be whatever's in the first index, actually. So that's fine. So we'll just remove whatever's at index one. And now, if I'm not mistaken, uh, index local game board card twenty seven. Uh, oh, because we're not calling uh, at pickup. We need to actually pass in the game board, which is down here. Yep, tableau and then game board. Right? Is that correct? Yep. Let's try that again. Uh, <laughs> so it's not moving it around. I mean, it's 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 <laughs> it's doing some weird stuff. But it it's working. It is shifting the um, it is shifting the card to the staging area and preserving its character. The fact that it's a queen of hearts. That part is staying consistent, which is great. Um, Kavabonga asks, wouldn't uh, non-version dependent if you would define table.move yourself and then use it anyway? Um, yeah, that could work, I guess. Um, I don't know if we'll need to use it elsewhere. Maybe if we need to use it in other places, we'll consider, excuse me, we'll consider implementing table.move ourselves. Um, if we ever updated this code base to a different version of Lua and they used a different table.move, that could cause problems. So I'm a little reluctant to do that if we know that table.move exists in the Lua landscape somewhere is my only, my only concern. Uh, LED52 says, just started the C50 course online. Take me four hours to complete the Mario task. Hey, but that's good though. Four hours for your very first uh, time going through CS50, that's, you know, that's faster than a lot of people get it finished. So good job on you. Uh, what we essentially did today was a graphical version of Mario, which is you know, different ballpark, different beast, but you know, same logic, essentially nested loops, right? Getting, the, getting your hands or getting your mind sort of wrapped around nested loops in a very comfortable way will serve you very well. Um, let's go ahead and figure out, first of all, what this weird behavior is. So we're clicking a card, and then it immediately is sort of getting shifted over. Now, the weird thing is that it seems to have reordered these cards a little bit in a strange way, right? Um, and then not only that, but it also... First of all, this isn't getting rendered correctly. I don't, <laughs> this is really weird behavior. So I don't know why, for example, okay, so well, I can't even click this anymore. It doesn't keep it, it doesn't keep the, um, the X, Y of the card being updated. Oh, because we're not updating the card in, um, we're not updating the picked up cards, I don't think. I think that's the, the problem. These need to be updated separately. So for 
i is equal to one until um, number of self dot picked up cards. Let's do um, self dot picked up cards i j update delta time self self dot tableaus actually well that doesn't need a reference to the tableaus I don't think let's try this uh game board 66 wait a second oh wait we don't need ij we just need wait we do need i j oh because j is not a thing right just i okay that should be fine uh <laughs> I always say that and then I, I'm always mistaken uh okay so self that picked up cards that did not work. They're not moving around. So if we go over to our card class, let's look at the update function once again. And let's see, if self dot picked up. Now self dot parent should be nil. Um, which means they should be aligned with the mouse cursor. Um, <laughs> and, oh wait. Uh, could it be this? Self dot picked up is false and game board dot card picked up is equal to false. Oh wait, is this? Oh, do I have this in two places? Oh, I do have this in two places. I'm not sure if that affects it much at all. No, it doesn't look like it does. It does move, it does keep moving the card though. Well, uh, <laughs> well the problem now that we have is if, we're, if we do have the game board being, uh, having a card picked up, we have to set it down um, once we do have it picked up. So, and then we need to, re we need to get rid of the cards in our tableau and then we need or in our picked up hand and add them to the other tableau, right? And actually, so now we need to check for um, <laughs> there's a lot of pieces involved here. So now what we need to do is we need to add them, basically check how, first of all, what we should do, we should figure out the fact that it's not moving the, uh, the cards around, why it stops. This is normal. Um, it's, trying to, it's trying to remove a, a card from the tableau, which uh, there's no cards anymore because it's a, we, there's only one card here. So as soon as we then click uh, there, which is weird, actually, because the tab, what it's not interacting with a card that's in the tableau, so I'm not entirely totally sure how that's happening. But um, the one important thing that's currently bugged is the fact that we are not the card's not moving around essentially. Um, Um, 
I also apologize that we're not moving terribly fast. This is a little bit more of a nitty gritty stream. So we're doing a lot of sort of algorithms and functions and stuff like that, um, as opposed to the more visual stuff. Uh, I mean, we did get you know this all rendering and whatnot. Um, there's a long ways to go. What we'll probably end up doing is before the next solitaire stream, which we can't do this week, we actually have streams all set up, and maybe the week after, is I'll come with some of the pieces pre-created, just so that it's not, we don't dwell too much time, uh, spend too many streams on solitaire. Um, because otherwise we might need a few more, we might need more than three. It's looking like it's relatively complicated. Um, but we'll see. Um, we'll see how it's, uh, uh, we'll see a little bit later. Logically, is it easier to click and drag? This way you could finish dealing with a card clicked when you release the button before another click happens. Um, not necessarily. Ultimately, I think it's the same amount of logic because we should just be able to set the card down as soon as we get to the next click and we are not set to picking up a card being equal to true, right? Or being equal to false. Um, let's, figure out, let's figure out why we're, first of all, why we're not moving around. So they clicked on the card. Um, the card got the picked up flag, right? We're updating the card every frame. Um, and we can actually test this, I think, if we were to go into, for example, the um, game board class and we say print updating a card and then we just run it. We should get this frame, we should get this frame by frame, right? So CD desktop or uh, so rather, um, actually where are we? CD dev streams, I believe, solitaire. And then we run this. We should get, we should be getting, um, oh, actually, interesting. We're not getting anything. Okay. Um, from one to one, it will still work, right? We are adding to self, we are adding to picked up cards, right? Am I, am I not mistaken? First of all, okay, let's do print number uh, self dot picked up cards. Let's do that first. Let's run this. Oh, it's zero. Okay, so we're not even adding it to the table. Okay, fascinating. Well, that's part of the bug. Okay, using echo debugging for the win. Um, we haven't actually put it in the right table. So this is where we normally do that. Table.insert gameboard.pickedupcards. Um, uh, Does it necessarily need to have a number? Because if it does, we could just say number, uh, or we could say, um, mm. let's see, table.insert. I see. So I think maybe it's getting confused because maybe it's expecting, um, oh, well, well, maybe, well, no. That shouldn't be the case, right? We should be able to just call table.insert with our game board picked up cards, right? We're inserting into game board picked up cards. That's our table of cards. And then we are removing, we're getting, a, we're adding what we're removing from the tableau at index one. Uh, Yes. Yes. And 
so why isn't that being transferred over? Um, if self dot picked up, right? Okay. We are calling self dot pick up. Yep. Uh, apologies for the bug. Just want to figure out what's going on. So, game board dot picked up cards is indeed the table that we care about. It's getting a size zero, um, so it's not actually getting the value and inserting it into the into the uh, into the table. So. Hmm. First of all, I don't need to be looking at main. I'm not sure I'm looking at main constants. We'll look at card pickup, right? Oh, wait. Uh, oh, wait, no, the tableau is fine because that's the tableau that, yeah, it's getting, it's, ta it's basically a reference to itself. It's getting a reference to its tableau. Um, this is a, a little bit of a weird way of doing it, but um, self.tableaus at ij update. And then where we're actually calling the, uh, if anybody happens to see the bug, if I'm just missing something obvious, definitely let me know. Um, to me, this seems, seems sound, but it's probably a silly bug that I'm just missing here, because we are passing in the tableau and the game board. And those that's the right order, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, the tableau and the game board, right, which is here. Self.pickedup is equal to true. And then they're, they're definitely not getting parents, right? Self.parent is always going to be nil when they first get instantiated right here. And we're not doing any explicit parent-child pairing just yet. So this is fine. Um, self. Okay, self colon pickup tableau, which is uh, tableau is getting passed in here. Yep. And then the game board is getting passed in as well. Game board card picked up is equal to true. I almost feel like it has something to do with this table insert. Um, am I just getting this order mixed up? Let me just let's make sure that table insert actually takes in. Um, yeah, it can take the value. Do we have to, is table.remove, table.remove is working, but it's not returning the value? Is it, am I getting this mistaken? Insert into a table, the new value, and then, uh, uh, wait a second. Oh, that's the position. I mean, we could specify the position if we want to. We could say, because um, I don't think this is strictly necessary, but table.insert, if we just say, Number of uh, game board dot picked up cards plus one, right? That'll just be the end of it. I don't see that fixing the problem, but yeah, see that doesn't fix the problem. It doesn't matter. Shoot. Okay. This is an odd, odd bug. Um. I apologize, this is taking so long. Um, I'm gonna commit what I have right now if anybody wants to, if anybody's interested in figuring out the current bug. And I hate the fact 
If we weren't in such a rush, we'd probably go for another hour. But uh, unfortunately, I have to leave at four. So we have 20 minutes to try and figure this out. But we'll do our best. Um, we'll say that this is going to be um, currently, bu currently buggy uh, card not adding to picked up cards. Oh, wait. Is it? Is it doing multiple click handles per O? Yes, that is probably it. That is probably it. So what's happening is it is updating the <laughs> so it's updating all of the cards in the, it's updating all of the cards in the tableaus. And on the same frame, directly after all of this happens, it's updating all of the cards in the picked up staging area. And on this frame, the same frame, we're getting the left click is equal to true. And it's doing two update calls for these, um, it's doing two update calls for this card. And so what we need to do is we actually need to bring this up above. We need to say, update the staging area, update all the cards, update all cards in hand first. And by, ah, oh, shoot, that didn't fix it either. Um, Damn, I thought I'd, I thought I found the problem. Okay. Shoot. Really? That was that that was definitely like a issue. The fact that we were calling two updates on the same card in the same in the same uh, loop or the same function body, that's the, that was a big cause of the issue. Um, so we're saying, should it be table.remove tableau uh, at the number of tableau? Um, uh, in card. Where is this? Um, um, that might be right, actually. <laughs> that was right. You're a genius. So rule CS, you're a genius. Look at that, beautiful. Oh man, whew. And oh, and look, it's drawing over the other card that was at index. Um, well, it was at uh, the seventh, the seventh column. That's amazing. I love it. But of course, I tried to to uh, get access to Tableau and it's nil, but that's okay because we can make, we can do checks for this. We can check to see whether it's null or not. And um, if it is null, we can just say, um, where do we say that? Where should we say that? Probably, um, Probably do something like uh, if tableau is equal to nil, then um, just break out, probably. Yeah, Sarul, good job. That was a great, great catch on your part, a very subtle thing. I don't know why I put one in there. Oh, this is just no loop to break here. 
uh, return. So now if I go over here, click this card again, nothing happens. It at least doesn't break, which is good. Um, however, it's not letting me pick it up again, which is kind of unfortunate. We can say, oh, actually, you know what I should do? I, we, can, we can enforce this in um, up here. I can just say picked up is equal to true. Uh, and then I'll say if Tableau is equal to nil here, then we'll return, right? So now I should be able to just pick the card back up again, which is great. All of this is fantastic. Um, however, these cards are both now in the, um, in the staging area. So both now those cards have their own separate hierarchy, their own Z index, as David referred to it. And so that presents another side problem. However, we don't care too much about that because we're never actually going to be using the game in this way. We'll only actually ever be able to put uh, cards onto other tableaus. And in the event that something like that happens where we are on top of another card, it's going to, and notice the queen was added to our staging area last, so the queen actually has priority over both the ace and this ace, and over everything else in the entire application. This king, same thing. Now it has priority over everything because we added it last, excuse me, last to our staging area. However, we don't care about it too much. Um, if you release a card without putting it down, it should snap back to its original position. Yeah, that's going to be the original or the end behavior that we want to strive for. Um, something that we'll have to cover in the next stream because this current stream, we're running low on time. This has taken a tremendous amount of time. Time flew by during the stream. I apologize that it was a little bit slow. It's a little bit of a crunchy stream today. A lot of functions, a lot of logic. Um, we have about 10 minutes left before, and I have to get out of here fairly urgently because I think there's um, some videos that need to be shot in here. But... Um, we were able to at least sort of get things bootstrapped up, built up in a way that soon we'll be able to do parent-child relationships and move things in the right position and then easily logic check that we have a winning condition. That, that part is pretty straightforward. The hardest part of this whole game is enforcing parent-child relationships and additionally um, uh, also doing like dragging of multiple cards together and making sure that we can put cards in different stacks and not have them staged actually enforce that they go back to their original position, if not their new position, if they fulfill the criteria for getting into that position. Uh, let's go ahead and commit this as being, and I'm just going to commit, get add everything, um, stacks in right position with staging area. Staging area is important because that's going to be where we do hold the card when we do want to click it later on. So that was a big, a big addition to the, um, a big addition to the the code base. We didn't make as much progress as I would have liked to make. I would have liked to make uh, at least the amount. Of, I would have at least liked to have us be able to click and drag stacks of cards. But in order to do that, we need to be able to click and enforce that a card go onto another card. And we ideally want to check for the numerical difference, the correct numerical difference. We want to be able to um, make sure that they are off-suited. And once we do that, then we establish parent-child relationships. Once the parent-child relationships are established, we can click a parent card, drag it around, have it drag its children around. But that's going to take much more than 10 minutes. Unfortunately, it'll probably take another couple of hours. And so that we don't spend so much time in the next stream not implementing solitaire and we actually finish, uh, what I think I'm going to end up doing on the next stream is actually make sure we come into it with uh, at least a solid idea of what to do, if not some like starting code, maybe the hard parts at least fleshed out. Because the easy parts, you know, ensuring the suits are correct, um, making sure it's their next number in the parent-child relationship, or sorry, not the parent-child relationship, making sure it's the next number in the tableau, making sure that the cards we put into the stacks are of the right uh, suit and the right number, starting with ace, working up to king, all of that stuff is actually pretty easy. The hard part, again, is just this manipulation of layered rendering and stacks and the, and the, um, the parenting. And that's, that's the hardest, trickier, that's the harder, trickier part of this, of this implementation. So again, apologies if this was a little bit um, lackluster if you're watching this. Um, I will not feel too bad if you skip through a lot of it and end up watching part three, because part three is where we're actually probably going to do most of the juicy stuff. Um, because we're going to run a little tight on time, I'm just going to, I think, say this will be it for today's stream, and I'll stick around for maybe five to ten minutes for questions. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, we all together we did a lot. We did a lot of rendering. We did a lot of um, the, a lot of game development. Unfortunately, is implementation of a lot of the less exciting stuff. Um, you know, things like all the hidden functions, getting ready to uh, you know the thing, the recursive functions where you can start establishing the the, the childing. Um, things like pick up here. Things like place down, where we know we're eventually going to need to place our card down. We're going to need to check whether it's a single card, whether it's a parent card. Um, we're going to, I think we didn't do much of this update here, but we did a lot of stuff here in update. Um, we had to refactor that quite a bit. We ended up actually doing the, uh, the Tableau generation today, which was sizable. The rendering of the Tableaus as well, the offsetting. Um, Layering all of all of our functions out so that they're pretty readable. Um, Andre says, "Not every day in game dev can be particles day." That's true. Yeah, unfortunately. Oh yeah, we started off rendering all this stuff down here too, and we ended up factoring up back up to the render tableaus and render pickup cards function. We didn't really do much with deck actually, but we did have the um, the deck rendering here now, which is nice. I mean, it's just a placeholder, but eventually we're going to click this deck, and it's going to create one of its cards. It's going to add basically to another table a. Um, a new face up card, right? And so that we'll be able to actually click and drag around and manipulate, and that's going to be kind of a side tableau of sorts, a side table, but we won't be able to put cards into it. It'll just be from the deck. So yeah, there's a lot of bits and pieces here, but we're making, making progress step by step. Um, but yeah, if anybody has any questions, definitely let me know. Now is the time to ask. If anybody wants to share any projects they're working on as well, <laughs> W. Wool, that's why we're using the Fisher Price Shuffle. Yeah, the Fisher Price Shuffle. I like that. It's funny. Um, parent child relationships, it'll be a psychology kind of game. Yeah, not quite. Not quite. No one I found that funny. Freudalitary. Freudalitary. Says it in Unfortunately, there might be a little bit of a, a Twitch delay. I'm glad we were at least resolved, thanks to um, Cerul CS for pointing out the, uh, the issue we were having. The fact that we can click and drag this, and now it's on its own separate layer. We've layered this out. That part alone was somewhat challenging, um, just because now we have to like reshuffle memory and get it so that things render in the right way. And we had a double render loop. I actually think the double render loop, the double click loop, was part of the problem. But the table remove at index one was probably the larger part there. But it occurred to me as we were doing it that on the same frame, if you click and you test and you allocate to that side table that then gets updated right after your main table, then they're both going to check for them being clicked. And then immediately it's going to place down. So. Uh, oh, no, Randy, I, no, I understood. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. Funny remark. I don't think there's any necessar necessarily better terminology. Anchoring, maybe, I guess you could say. Anchoring relationship. But parent-child tends to be common, especially in like HTML, like the DOM and stuff like that. Child nodes. Parent nodes, child nodes. It's, I think, ubiquitous. It's just an easy thing to think about. Parenting is perfect. Some, some parents might disagree with that statement, Andre. Some people might not think that parenting is perfect. I've heard from many that parenting is, in fact, stressful. <laughs> it can be. Also in trees. Oh, yeah. Yeah, true. You have the, the I guess, the root node to stick with the tree terminology. And then you have leaf nodes, but also they do refer to, a lot of the time, trees as having parents and children. Since there's a lull, I'd like to point out that yesterday was Andre's birthday. Oh, happy birthday, Andre. That's awesome. Didn't realize it was your birthday. Didn't see it on Facebook. Facebook didn't notify me. Um, to be fair, I don't check it too much on the weekends, so that might be part of the reason. But happy birthday. Hope you spent it well. Hope you spent it uh, doing the things that you enjoy doing. Absolutely. And again, any questions on the code base, on Love2D, on games, on CS50, 
Bella Kier saying thank you for the stream. My pleasure. Thanks for sticking around. I'm sorry it was a little bit drier today than it normally is. This was a little bit of a, like I said, a more nitty gritty type stream, an engineering stream. Um, programming is complicated sometimes. And bugs are hard sometimes to see. Those are, those are subtle. You know, you, uh, the one versus the length, that can cause a lot of headaches. And game development is, is worse. Because in games, a lot of the time, it's not obvious where something is happening. It's just obvious that there's a visual disturbance. You don't necessarily know, unless through tuition, where it's actually happening. And to who, whomever's point earlier, who mentioned debugging, um, uh, Bakanova, I think it was, something like that, um, it can be challenging. But we are going to finish this game, um, whether it's in this stream, no, sorry, whether it's in the next stream or some other stream, um, likely what I want to do is uh, I'll spend a few minutes just off camera kind of figuring out, for this one in particular, because it's a little bit, little bit meatier and I want to make sure we have a consistent flow for the next part, um, I'm going to probably pre-do a little bit or at least tinker with it and at least know in my head what I need to do. And then we'll have kind of a trajectory. I might take some notes that everything's still from scratch, but it's just um, smoother, less, less figuring out of bugs, because I don't want to waste anybody's time. Um, Cyril says, thanks, Colton. Deeply nostalgic. Yeah, well, my pleasure. I'm glad that you enjoyed. Um, you're a brave soul for live programming. I enjoy it. I don't enjoy lulls, like terrible lulls. Um, True Canise, uh, did we have Solitaire Part 2 not on the Twitch schedule? Uh, part 2 should have been um, listed out. Is that not right? And actually, part three, if there's part three listed, that needs to be removed. Um, we actually need to reallocate time this week. Uh, yeah, part, yeah, part three, the fact that it's still there, that needs to be shifted. Um, so we're actually doing no Solitaire part three this week. It'll probably be next week. We are doing Cookie Clicker on Wednesday. That is still happening. Um, that one's quite a bit easier and simple and will be fun on board for I think people new to game development. Um, and also thank you for broaching Tutorial Spiller and Ngame AFS and Sorab00345. Thank you very much for the follows. Um, no stream tomorrow. Tomorrow well, we're just doing, um, yeah, we're not doing any stream tomorrow. Um, despite what the schedule says, it's my bad. I need to update that. That needs to go away. Um, Solitaire Part 3 will likely be either next week or the week after that. Like I said, unfortunately, we have to shift things around a little bit. Cookie Clicker will be on Wednesday, and JavaScript will be on Friday. So stick around for those, both of those at 1 p.m. Um, the Cookie Clicker one, a very nice on-ramp, like I said, for brand new folks to game development and JavaScript if you're looking for more of a web development um, sort of on-ramp. And both of those will be a lot smoother because those are a lot simpler than, um, than Solitaire. And next Solitaire stream will be a lot nicer and smoother too. Uh, we love the problem solving, awesome. Oh, NACL Eric, no problem. Today's stream was uh, a little on the dry side. It was a lot of sort of, um, sort of like foundational programming for higher level stuff that we'll get to in the next stream sort of building our way up uh, piece by piece. But we do have a nice game board. If you want to see what it looks like, here's what it looks like now. We have all of the cards sort of laid out. Um, this is more or less what the game is going to look like from the very beginning, except this will have cards that we can draw. We can click and move around these cards, which is pretty cool. Notice that they take rendering priority despite where they are on the game map. Um, unfortunately, we don't have anything much beyond that. The next stream is going to involve establishing parent-child relationships. It's going to involve us being able to flip hidden cards which I just did right there, and it didn't work too well, because unfortunately that part is still bugged. But that was another thing we implemented today, the ability to flip with right-click hidden cards in our stacks. Um, but right now it seems to be bugged such that it reveals all hidden cards, even though we supposedly fixed that earlier. But, you know, things happen. Bugs happen. Um, I can't right-click this card and have it work, so we did account for that issue. However, if I move this off and then right click, we do reveal all the underlying cards. So we're halfway there, but we still have a ways to go. And uh, also by next stream, we will not have any more of these cards being staged. We will not have any staging area. We will only be able to place cards into uh, new areas 
or have them revert back to where they were before we clicked them. So a lot of things going on. And lastly, of course, we'll be able to take cards like the ace and put them up here and start building up our piles. And we should have some sort of marker to signify that these cards are indeed uh, being stacked, maybe by tinting them yellow or something so that they're visibly locked here and we can't move them around like this. Um, make them build up um, pursuit and based on their value. Oh, and another thing we also need to consider is the ability to not only um, move things off of the grid uh, appropriately, but also make sure that we take a king, for example, and are able to reallocate it to a new tableau. So that's an important thing. So shifting, more of this card shifting, which is an important aspect um, of this game. But we're making our way there. We have a lot of work to go, but um, we're doing stuff. Um, OK. Uh, True Kinney, sorry, I missed the stream, but the schedule mentions this would be on Tuesday. So no, this is uh, Monday. We're doing Solitaire Part 2. Tuesday was going to be Part 3, but we actually need to shift that. That's actually going to be next week. So I'm going to immediately edit this. This is going to be um, as of 10 minutes after the stream. It's going to say no stream. And then we'll probably end up doing a Solitaire Part 3 next week or the week after, depending on how time uh, allows. Um, we have to, unfortunately, shift the schedule a little bit. but. We will be doing Cookie Clicker on Wednesday, and we will be doing JavaScript Basics on Friday. Those two are still on the schedule and will be on the schedule for sure. Part three has always been kind of tentative, and that's why we didn't publicize it. Part two is, uh, has been publicized, and that is reflected as showing on Monday on the, on the Twitch stream. Um, debugging lulls are great for us to learn. Don't worry about it, says Asley. I feel terrible about them, though. Um, true Kines. It's still off a day, even if it accounts for the 1 p.m. to 7 p.m. conversion. That's weird, because for me, I'm seeing it uh, reflected correctly. So I'm not entirely sure um, how you're seeing it off, because on mine, it says Monday. Other people, can, can you confirm um, and tell me if it shows it as being correct? The schedules appear in your local time. They do for me, says Irene. I think Irene is saying, uh, that's weird. Interesting. I see it as correct. I hope it's not a bug. Um, interesting. What time zone are you in? Um, True Kines, if you can tell me what time zone you're in, actually. I'm not, that's very strange. CET. Happy Sunday on Monday. I definitely don't have that online. That's weird. I will look at that and debug that, because as far as I was aware, this has been accurate and it looks good. Um, but I apologize for anybody who has been looking at this and seeing things shifted today. I'm not sure why. This is a new, a new uh, scheduler widget. It might be broken for some time zones. So let me investigate a little bit more, maybe by changing my clock or something to a different, um, to a different thing. Yeah, East Coast, um, that's correct. That chat cat is saying the schedule looks good. Oh, it's supposed to be plus five? Oh, interesting. I think when I, I did it at plus five, it was bugged. I think I might have tried that initially. I don't remember. I, I, I remember having to futz with it to get it to show the right time. Um, I'll take a look at it. I apologize for the folks who, who it's broken for. To set the record straight, uh, tomorrow, Tuesday, no stream, uh, Wednesday, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we'll be doing Cookie Clicker. And Friday, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we'll be doing JavaScript Basics, um, including syntax, a little bit of DOM stuff, like document.get uh, element by ID and query selector. And then lastly, we'll be doing a little bit of dynamic bootstrap in JavaScript to sort of tie together the last, Java, or the last bootstrap stream that we did where we only looked at the CSS parts. So we'll kind of tie in the new with the old, and uh, everything will be great. Cool. All right, we're at 404. I've gone over a little bit. I know that some folks need to get in here to use it, the video software, so apologize to them. Thank you all for uh, your patience today. Um, it, like I said, not the most exciting, um, glorious stream we've had. It was a, a little bit more down, you know, get your hands dirty type of stream and more into the weeds, as we say. Um, but next stream, we'll sort of have a smoother flow. So this was CS50 on Twitch. This was Solitaire Part 2. Stay tuned for Part 3 next week and see you all on Wednesday for Cookie Clicker, which is a great if you're brand new to game development. So have a good rest of your evening.